Hello, this is the 68th episode of the Fun Filter Podcast. I'm Jordan, that's Sam. Hello! And this is my impression of a duck mm-hmm. that's just been told something. Yes. That's confused it. Okay. Quack? <laughs> well, coming up. I recommend a show, and Sam recommends a show. Sharing. <laughs> we don the gloves of critical and the shorts of review as we go 12 rounds with Creed 3. Your very own Joel and Ellie take a prolonged stroll through The Last of Us Season 1. We review the Super Mario Brothers movie. And Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Well, I want to recommend a little BBC show. Okay. Called Blue Lights. You familiar with this? Uh, not even remotely. No, okay. Should what? I be? Is like... Well, I don't is know. It, is, it, is, it, is it a thing that people know about on TV? Well, the thing is, I don't watch television. Even though I watch yeah. all the television, I don't actually watch television. Well, this is sort of what I'm getting at. Is this one of those shows that, ironically, only people that watch television would know about? I don't know, because, as in, I don't know how heavily it was advertised. Yeah. There are no A-list stars in it, mm. so I don't know if it was heavily fetid. I, I don't know... I really don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, like, it, it didn't have a Wikipedia article until very recently. Okay. And I think the one of the things that might put people off it initially is that there is a dearth of familiar faces. Right. There are a couple. I would say the most recognizable is probably Richard Dormer, who people would know from Game of Thrones. Okay. And Fortitude, maybe. Right, okay. He was the lead in, uh, I think for all of it, actually. Yeah, it's kind of grim, happy, valley-esque in a way. Okay. Uh, Which is, it's about police, obviously, blue Mm. lights, uh, in Northern Ireland. It's very down and dirty, in the streets. Essentially, it follows three newbies to the job, three trainees, Mm. two of whom are young, one of whom is a woman in her 40s with kind of a teenage son who had a career in social work, but is now working for the police. Okay. But it's weird. You, You would expect it to be a kind of episodic, this is what happened on the beat that day, it's grim sort of thing. Mm. But it actually, there's a lot more... There are villains in it, like this Irish crime syndicate that have connections to international arms dealing and all that sort of thing. And there are twists that you don't expect, and it's a lot tighter than that kind of show usually is. Okay. It's a bit like... Have you heard of an American show called... Um, no. N- no? No. I can't even remember the title. It's South something. Park? No, it's not South <laughs> Park. It's one word. Okay. And it's uh, that's very S.H.I.E.L.D.-esque. Where it's that handheld camera, it's LA cops. Right. But it's that kind of thing. I would say Blue Lights is the that to Happy Valley's The Shield. Okay. Um, I re- it's really bothering me. It's Regina King was in it. It's not, it's not something simple like Southland, is it? That's what it is. Oh, it is. There you go. I think okay. it's Southland, yeah. I think it's Southland. All right. Anyway, you'll, you can Google it after the fact. Mm. Richard Dormer is really good in it. He is the standout uh, in performances. It's just one of those gems that you might otherwise overlook. But I don't know if people have watched it. Yeah. But I would recommend that you watch it. It's only six episodes. Well, it must have, yeah, it must have caught your attention if it's, if, if, if we're not doing a proper review of it, but you thought it worth bringing up anyway. Yeah, 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 definitely. I didn't think it was the kind of show that demanded you watch it all so we could do a review. Mm. I just think you would like it. I think people who like TV would like it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, worth bringing up. A bit like Bad Sisters. Yeah. Uh, okay. And it's been renewed for a second season, so... Okay, all yeah. right. I kind of have one of those, if we're doing quick... Oh, yeah, like, sure. You kind of already know about it, okay. in, the, in that, like, you've seen me watching it. Okay. But, like, to the to the listeners of the podcast, I doubt anyone will know what it is. It's a show called Community Squad. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Argentinian workplace comedy that's kind of sitting on Netflix at the moment. I imagine it's something that nobody has seen, because I think yeah. on Netflix it's being advertised... With its Argentinian name. Okay. So it's like Division Poliso or right, something right, weird right, like right. that. I don't know what the current, like, state of comedy is on television. In the Dyer. sense... Well, I was going to say, like, in the sense that if you just, like... If you're just someone who's booting up, like, a comedy that's been recently, like... You've recently heard about. Yeah. I don't know what sort of quality you you uh, expect nowadays. Well, I, I would say, I don't know, in terms of popularity and in viewing figures, but the most zeitgeisty comedy is probably Abbott Elementary. Okay. Which is a mockumentary about a elementary school. Mm. And it's kind of a clone of every other mockumentary you've seen, mm. but the cast all happen to be black. Right. And it's not one of those, like, 
politically annoying. Mm. There's a bit of that, but it's just the it's everything you've ever seen in a mockumentary. Yeah. It's really not doing doing nothing new with it. There's the Halloween episode, the Christmas episode, right, okay. 22 episode season. You know, it's The Office, it's Brooklyn Nine Nine, it's Parks and Rec. Yeah. But I don't think it's as good as any of those. No. Some people would argue to the contrary. That and Ted Lasso are probably the two biggest things, which isn't that funny. Okay. And increasingly isn't that funny. Are you an island with that opinion, or are other people? Saying that it's not. Well, those are the two shows that win every fucking award. Okay. Um, I don't know what the man in the street yeah. thinks about it. Um, you know, man with a van sort of thing. Mm. It's not funny. It's not. I mean, comedies are increasingly not funny. Yeah. Well, I was going to say. Um, around the same time I saw Community Squad, I found a show called Animal Control. Ah, uh, yeah. A new yeah. show. But that's a show that wants to be funny. But is just bad, bad at it. Oh yeah, so Whereas I was gonna a lot say, of comedies that's, now that's diabolical. That show, yeah, it's but that, really that's just funny. bad. Like yeah. a most, a lot of comedies now that are very praised, mm. they're not even going for that particularly. Okay, they 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 kind of comedy dramas that lean more towards the drama. Barry would be a good example, but that does what it does so well. Yeah, that you don't complain about the absence of laughs because that's part of the package. Right. Okay. Whereas something like Ted Lasso, which should be Basically, Ted Lasso is like USP, mm. is that it's feel good in a world of cynical comedy and all yeah. the rest of it. But it's kind of not even that anymore. Like the second season, they tried to up the ante with he's suffering with depression. And right. uh, they have like a um, an episode that's stylized a bit like Martin Scorsese's After Hours. Okay. Which is like the episode that's a departure from all the other episodes, mm. which is another cliche that's getting old. Yeah. Which Atlanta kind of is. Uh, well, I mean, guilty, commu- so. Community did a lot of that, but that was part of that show's DNA. Y- yeah. So I don't know if there were comedies prior to that that were doing the single stylist. Buffy did it, right? Yeah, there's a difference. But like, Community had the, like, oh, this is the, the cowboy episode or whatever. Mm. But the through line is that it's always funny. Yeah. Whereas there's a lot in comedy now where you'll have the one episode that's a stylistic departure that's trying to be like a, an issue episode. Mm. And if not an issue like drugs or homelessness or whatever, it's like a character arc within an episode. You know, yeah. they're kind of self-consciously... It, back in the day... Sorry, I'm going off the tangent here. You are, yeah. But, you had but, a, but, but no, go for it. Okay, yeah. you had bottle episodes. And yeah. the reason you had bottle episodes was was budgetary. You couldn't keep affording to go out on set, or, you know, uh, out, sorry, filming, um, you know, in, in relocations. So as limited use of set as possible. Mm. So writers had to be clever and come up with stories that worked in one location. And because that demanded clever writing, they ended up being really good episodes Mm. because they asked the writer to go that extra mile. So they're often highlighted as, you know, like Fly with Breaking Bad is another example. Yeah. Budgetary. Mm. We got to just keep it in the lab. And it's, you know, it's a very divisive episode, but I think we would argue one of the best episodes. Yeah. But now, it, bottle episodes are self-conscious in their design, which is, this will be the bottle episode. Right. And I know that, because I was part of a university course that studied script writing, where we had that exact mindset of, like, oh, what could be a cool bottle episode mm. that's going to single out the writing? And yeah, the, yeah. And I think it, it, now it, it's just so tired now at this point. But yes, Abbott Elementary and Ted Lasso, I would say, represent the current state of comedy, which is not funny. Right, okay. Um, so I was going to say, with Community Squad... It's, like I said, it's Argentinian, and it's sort of about this guy who's kind of going through this shit period in his life. Like, the first scene of the first episode, he's sort of, he's gone to buy a new bed with his Mm -hmm. girlfriend, and there's an incident that happens in the store that he freaks out about, Mm -hmm. and it's sort of humiliating for him. And the girlfriend kind of says to him, you know what, I've been unhappy in our relationship for a while, but this has just proven to me that we should break up. And then the next scene is him telling his father about that, and the father's like... Well, you know, I was actually going to fire you today. Um, I'll give you all of your inheritance so you can make a life for yourself, but I think it's time for you to go off on your own and live your own life. Mm -hmm. And then in the following scene, all of his money gets immediately stolen. Right, right. So he's like a really shit point in his life. And he goes to the police to report the crime. But uh, unbeknownst to him, they're conducting interviews for a community squad, Mm -hmm. which is basically this cynical, within the framework of the show now, deliberately cynical, like move from the local government to improve the image of the police force. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just this division of disabled people. Taking boxes. Taking boxes, yeah. yeah. They have no real power. They're not real policemen. They literally just like send them out into the community to do nice things. Yes. To make it look like the police are actually good people and not corrupt as shit. Right. And he 
goes in for that interview thinking he's actually talking about the crime and he ends up like doing a really good job mm. unbeknownst to him and mm. because he's Jewish they bring him in right, right they're right, like right. oh that'll be our angle is like oh we're, we're representing the Jews yeah. so we'll bring him into this if I was doing like a talk or presentation or like an educational like package I suppose mm. on comedy because mm. Like, the the older, I don't know if it's the same for you, but the older I get, the more I find myself disagreeing with the statement comedy is subjective. Um. I think humor is subjective, but I think comedy is very much a science. Like, you can you can make objectively bad okay. comedy. I, I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like being funny, yeah, that yeah. is a gift yeah. to a certain degree. And there are people who would make terrible comedies that could make people laugh. So, in other words, and you're saying versa. you can be a good practitioner of comedy and not be funny yeah yes so as in set up punchline yes yes I, yes okay. and likewise See you can have very funny people who can't write a comedy worth shit absolutely yeah um and this is the the, the case study that i would use mm -hmm. is community squads because despite the fact that it's in a language i don't understand mm -hmm. i did find it funny okay and i thought that it was objectively a well-staged comedy okay so it's taking both boxes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the kind of the, the thrust of the comedy through the show is um, it's kind of like the way that these people with disabilities are getting treated. Yeah. Um, but it's not like it doesn't feel preachy and it doesn't feel like it's trying to make a point. It mm. just it's making fun of people with disabilities and it's kind of show like putting the people that are doing that in a bad light, mm. but without being soapboxy about it. Okay. Um, like there's a moment where they're interviewing a midget for the uh, for the community squads um, or little person whatever yes, I'm yeah, supposed yeah, to say yeah. but like in the show they call him a midget yeah, all the yeah, time yeah. so that's what you know that's why it came to mind yeah. but yeah they're interviewing him and the interview is over so he's kind of like collecting his stuff mm -hmm. and then the two people they're interviewing kind of lean in and they go we should definitely hire him because we can just hide him in places right, right and the bad right, guys right. will never see him yes and they turn back and he's still there because, so, like, he put his head yeah. under the table they thought he left, but he's just still there watching them talk yeah, about yeah, him. Yeah, 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 And he doesn't have this moment where he's like, oh, how fucking dare you? He's just, like, he just awkwardly walks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's making fun of the attitudes towards it. Yes. Like, well, like apparently well-meaning, but actually not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, like, there's a, there's a girl in a wheelchair, and, like, she goes out in the street at one point on patrol, mm. and this old man just sort of comes up to her and goes, oh, let me help you cross the street, and just, mm. like, takes her across the street where she's not supposed to be. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just leaves her there and she can't get back because the traffic's too busy. It's kind of like extras in the office did. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, that kind of cringe, a bit cringy. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. But it's well thought out. And the comedy in the show is very well staged as well. Going mm. back to that little person, there's like, so the, 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 the whole thing with the community squad is, oh, you're not real police officers. You're not in any real danger. Mm -hmm. But they do inadvertently get embroiled in this like mafia plot. Right. Um, so there is this, like, real threat brewing underneath the surface of the whole show. Uh, like, the first episode ends with, like, one of the main characters getting shot in the face. Right. So it's like a, oh, fuck, there is real danger yeah, out there yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. thing. So they want to, like, break into this facility that they think will help reveal the location of where the mafia is set up. Mm -hmm. And the guy who's kind of in charge of everything, he looks at, he's, like, uh, planning it with a little person. And they, he sees, like, a box next to him that's exactly the same size as him. Right. And he's like, oh, if we can smuggle you in. And the, the little person's like, don't even fucking suggest yeah. it. And he's like, no, I'm just saying. He's like, no, 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 we're not fucking doing mm. that. He's like, fine, okay. And then a couple of scenes later, you're in that facility they're trying to break into. And the exact same box, like, is brought into the warehouse and left alone. Mm. And this camera starts, like, tracking in on it. And the music starts to swell. Yeah, yeah. And then you just hear this window break off screen. Yes. And it, like, okay. whip pans. And the little person's, like, yes. coming in through the broken window. A fake out. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, objectively, like, well-staged comedy yes. all throughout. I wouldn't say that it's, like... Expectation subversion of expectation. Exactly, yeah. I'm not going to say that it's, like, uh, like a really, really funny show. I'm no. not going to say it's, oh, it's one of the best comedies ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think just, like, as a good comedy... As a good thing to study sort of thing. Not, not even not, that. Not, I'm just not saying, like, to not, watch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's, like, boring. No. But it's a good example of, like, oh, this is comedy 101 sort of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think just as a thing to watch... Um, there is obviously an English dub, but like even if you just watch it with subtitles, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is still a funny show. Yeah. But I think because it's Argentinian, mm -hmm. people will just skim past it on Netflix and not yeah, even yeah, realise yeah. what it's supposed to be. So yeah, I'd put that forward just as like a, a little hidden, maybe not okay. quite a hidden gem, but just a hidden something you might resonate with. Okay, fair. And it's called Community Squad. It's called Community Squad. It's like 
like I said, it's Division something on Netflix, but if you just... Division Disability. Something like that. <laughs> but if you type in Community Squad on Netflix, it does still come up. Yeah, okay. All right. Should we move into a mutual review? Let's do that. Creed 3. Oh, have you got anything better to... <laughs> Uh, we can talk about better um yeah i mean you know there's other stuff coming up but okay. let's just get this done oh get it out of the way all right um well i suppose the the the, the good news mm. this might be jonathan major's last project for a while <sighs> amber heard's back isn't she yeah but hang on what is, what's jonathan major's accused of doing domestic abuse yeah the thing with amber heard is even though she is I would say inarguably guilty of domestic abuse mm. from what we've heard, uh, whether that's whether that's just verbal or you know whatever. Yeah, people remember her as having shit the bed. Yeah, uh, literally. Yeah, so it's like f- f- we forgive easy, and nobody likes her, mm. but it's like funnier. Like there were funny aspects of that trial. Yeah, of that horrific trial. Mm. Domestic abuse. There's no like. I see the funny side. Oh there. well, no, of course. So, no, so I'm saying so. Maybe it, it will be harder for him to bounce back. But I don't know. He's the it man at the moment, and can't, you can't do bad things if you're brown, can you? Well, this is well, this is what's so strange about it. Is I I don't personally have anything against Jonathan Majors. It's not like uh, I ha- I haven't decided. You you can share your opinion in a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. It's not as if like I decided. Oh, he's a terrible actor. Therefore, he's a terrible person. He's, yeah, he must be dealt with. Mm. It's just all of a sudden he was the biggest thing in Hollywood, and I felt like I hadn't been given the chance to get to know him yet. Well, that's my my only problem, really. I don't think he's. A, I don't have a problem with him necessarily. I don't think he's a bad actor. Yeah. I just don't get the Jonathan Majors thing. I don't yeah. get the thing. You know, like he is the guy of the moment. Yeah. Like in the same week, he had Creed three and Ant Man. Yeah. In the cinemas. Much. Yeah. And I haven't seen him do anything. Uniquely impressive. Yeah, I don't know where he came from. I don't know well, he came where from... he was supposed to have proven himself or why all of a sudden well, the, he's the, 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 the huge draw at the moment. The breakout film was a film called The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Okay. In which he was the friend character, but he kind of impressed people in that. Mm. Uh, then he was in Lovecraft Country, the HBO show. He was the, oh, okay. People did he was watch the that, man. didn't they? It was a good show, yeah. a decent show. I didn't think he was particularly great in it. Okay. But the strength of the show carried him to where he is now. Yeah. That's kind of it, you know. And then he's in Marvel. Yeah. Um, as the big as, yeah, thing. Thanos Mac 2. Yeah. But there's been articles online saying they're thinking of recasting him. And then the following day is like, oh, he's already been recast. Then the day after it's like, oh, they're, they're thinking about it. So I don't know what the situation is with him at the moment. Well, I, w- I wouldn't say the beauty, but the the beastliness of MCU is that it can easily be recast. Yeah, even Just with... Just come up with some bullshit. Even with that, like, post-credit thing with Ant-Man where there's, like, billions of him in that one room. It's like, well, we'll just see the versions of him that weren't in that room. But given... That, that, that are played by Michael B. Jordan or Toby Campbell or whoever the fuck they, they recast them yeah, as. Yeah, but similarly with Doctor Who, the MCU is the point now where it keeps having to introduce things that are bigger and badder and, and you know... Mm more explodier and more meaningful ostensibly than everything that's come before it. Yeah. So the fact that until now we didn't know there existed this Kang in the MCU of whom there are billions of iterations, mm. surely it's just as easy to snuff it out as it was to introduce it in the first place. Yeah. I didn't know about it till now and apparently it's really important. Yeah. So you can just as easily go, oh yeah, someone like Galactus sneezed and now there's no more Kangs. Yeah. Y- you know, like that's the horror of that franchise. Yeah. So maybe they will recast him. I don't know. Yeah. It'll be with another black man. I you know, don't see them changing that. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because like, I didn't, like, I didn't hate him in Creed 3. I no, guess, I thought he was fine. Yeah, I guess Creed 3 was his chance to show me that like, no, he is a good actor. Yeah. When you actually put him in a role where, yeah. where he plays a character, he can do it. And he was fine. He's I co- fine. I couldn't really understand him. And I don't know whether it's just the copy <laughs> that we were watching was badly right. like mixed or something. But a lot of his dialogue just kind of bled together. And I know that like the character yeah. was kind of talking in that from the streets, yeah. I suppose. Like, so it like, was blending. To but... obviously America, there's, there's a diversity of accents. Mm-hmm. I think to our ear, African-American dialects in America are a bit harder to differentiate. Yeah. Like when we think of a black African American, a black accent, mm. it's kind of universal. 
Yeah. That's right. in, in America, you know, African-American. Yeah. Whereas you think of like the deep south, Boston to New York, we have all these differences. But black is just that kind of thing, man. You know, we don't really know the difference. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure he's doing like a Philly. Yeah, there's like a specific black, subgenre you know? that he's uh, yeah. Yeah, filling. And it's a bit harder to pick up for us. Yeah. You know. It'd be the um, same the other way around though, wouldn't it? Like as I said, oh, yeah. when we did the Happy Valley review last episode, it's like, if you're not from Britain, you're probably going to need subtitles there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Even though we got most of it, you will probably need that help. That's a bit, well, I think that's a function of, partly a function of America being so insular, which is like, they can't, like, they need uh, subtitles for train spotting. Now, I know the Glaswegian accent is a thick accent. Yeah. But if we can understand Louisiana, and if we can understand, you know, all the, the variations in America, and we can, we know what they are. I know America's a big, a bigger cultural force. So yeah. Like, we know what a Boston movie is like and what, you know, a Mississippi movie is like, but f- it's still English. I understand yeah. what Australians are saying and what Kiwis are saying. Well, it's it's like that that Dylan Moran joke, isn't it? Like with the, with Americans, the voice does tend to carry. You never find yourself saying to an American, "Yeah, sorry, what was that?" Yeah, that is true. Yeah, that's true. But still, I I, I don't know. You know, I just put, they should put in more of an effort, <laughs> right? Well, Americans, yeah, okay. Like, is there any British accent you find it particularly hard to? I mean, we're talking about incredibly localised accents now, like North Walian, or there are probably parts of England as well where it's mm. like it's so thick, mm-hmm. like farmer country, like the kind of thing they yeah. make fun of in hot in fuzz. hot fuzz. Yeah. yeah, I think that Irish like I don't know, you know, yeah. and you're like, okay, yeah, I didn't get any of that. No. but I don't think Irish people would understand. That. No, <laughs> like, I don't yeah. think that's you know, uh, I don't know. Anyway, tangent. Yeah, pre three, pre three. Well, that's just. Do it. Uh, here, the problem... So I'm going to do it kind of chronologically. Okay. All right? The problem with child act... So the film... Don't do the plot. Do the plot first. Oh, this, so do we need to do the plot? It's a Rocky film. The plot is... Yeah. One of the Rocky films that have already been done. Well, not exactly. I mean... Or bits yes. of other Rocky films. It's all bits of Rocky films put together. Yeah. It's about his... Adonis, Donnie, a childhood friend of his... Yeah. That was in juvie in prison and then comes back into his life and they end up fighting. Yeah. That's the plot. Yeah. Um, he's retired. Adonis is retired now. Yeah, he's now living in LA with a mansion. and oh. Yeah, he runs a gym that trains up all these other yes. people, all these other fighters. And the, the the guy that comes out of jail is like, oh, you're living my life. So yes. I want my shot. So uh, unbeknownst to him of his evil intentions, Adonis puts him to the front of the queue. He cheats his way into winning the world championship. Adonis comes out of retirement to, to win it back. That's what it's about. So the film starts with a flashback till I think it's 2002 or three. Yeah. To them as kids. Mm. Here's the problem with actors that were already in films at the time the flashback was set. Michael B. Jordan's first major role was on The Wire. He played Wallace. Yeah. So I know exactly what he looked like in 2002. Right. And it's not the kid in the film. Okay. Now I know that's like, you can't get around that. I was going to say, is that the film's fault? It's not the film's fault. It's it's the, the fault of reality, and you know? I I know what he looked like. Okay. It's I, the trailer for the Flash, which just came out. It's not exactly the same thing, but they show a young Ezra Miller, and it's a good young Ezra Miller. Hmm. But I also know what Ezra Miller looked yeah. like at that age. He was in a film around that time, and I've seen young versions of him in other films, and it's one of those just. But I know that young Ezra Miller, yeah. rather than this one. Anyway. Uh, I didn't like the Sherlock Holmes-esque fight sequences. Yeah, so this film, it's the first one in the series, maybe not the last, to have actually been directed by Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. I've seen the interviews as well where he's talking about, basically he's talking about the franchise as though it's his now. It kind of is. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. he's been the star of the last two He's starring and directing in this one. He's done, he's done a Stallone. Well, no, exactly, because Stallone did write Rocky yeah. and the rest of them. But he directed, I think, the second onward. Okay. He didn't do the first, but yeah, the second onward. Second onwards. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he's talking about like uh, potentially spinning this off into like sub-franchises. Right. My assumption was with Jonathan Majors. I don't know if that's going to be reconsidered now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because who, who else do you spin off? If you're going to do a spin-off of Creed, who else do you follow? Well, it's one of the problems. It's not exactly... If there were ever a series less demanding of a franchise, it's, yeah. it's the Creed 
it doesn't launch to mine. Yeah, no, that's, that's what, that was one of the interesting things about the first Creed. It's like, oh, they found the only way you probably could spin off Rocky. Yeah, this it's not a rich world, and that's not to the detriment of... I love Rocky. I love the Rocky series. Yeah. Rocky is one of my favorite films, and the others, I'm always going to have, you know, a passion for them, because yeah. I grew up with them. Mm. But they, they're all the same film, really. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just with slight variations. You just want that, yeah, when he wins at the end. Yeah. It's not like, oh, there's all these possibilities. Like, what, I want a franchise focusing on the music career of Tessa Thompson or something. Like, yeah. Well, what's the through line? Well, yeah. I mean, like, in terms of boxing, you either do Jonathan Majors. Yeah. Maybe Drago's son? Like, if they want to do that. Well, they're all in this one, aren't they? Drago's yeah. son and the, the, the villain from the first one. Yeah. He fights him at the beginning. Yeah, if you want to do them. Yeah. Then, like, okay. But, yeah, if you, as soon as you go outside of boxing, like, well, this is just a different... This is something else. Yeah, though. this is the Philly saga. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we've got to st- we've sort of this ad infinitum, ad nauseum, actually, but we've got to stop with the spin off thing, right? Yeah, we've got to stop <laughs> like, franchising. If Creed is a spin off franchise, is getting its own spin off franchise. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit silly. But the point I was going to make is yeah. It's, it's, yeah, this is the first one that he's directed. Yeah. Sounds like it won't be the last. And he's definitely trying to make it his own. Yeah. Because, like, you've got... I remember the, the Ryan Coogler one. I don't remember much about it, but I remember the fight sequences being very well done. Yeah. I don't know whether they were shot... I think a couple of them were shot in real time, maybe even in one take. I think one was, yeah. Yeah. I, or, like, uh, fake, anyway. A fake one. Take, yeah, yeah, and you can sort of see the fighters getting injured in real time, yeah, yeah. and it's very impressive, the mm-hmm. way it's done. And then that final fight sequence, I think, was very traditional in how a Rocky fight sequence is presented. Yeah. But it still genuinely had that punch to it, where it's like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm into it now. I yes. want the guy to win. Yes. Um, I remember literally nothing about Creed 2. No, nothing at all, other yeah. than it was Rocky 4. So they did 4 in yeah. 2. Yeah, but it wasn't Rocky 4, because it was really yeah. bland, and there was no cheesiness. And it yeah, was, no, it really does. I genuinely can't remember it. Um, whereas this one, it's like, he's gone, right, how do I make this film my own now? Yeah. I'll be innovative with a fight sequence. Yeah, so you've got these like ultra slow mo Sherlock Holmesy yeah moments, and also for maybe the first time in the Rocky franchise, moments where the action is kind of taking place in a non reality. It gets abstract. Yeah. 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 It's kind of metaphorical in its presentation of even though it is just showing you the fights. Yeah. The arena that they're in is kind of reflecting a, a memory ring yeah there's yeah. there's all of a sudden there's no crowd and there's like facets of their life being represented by mm-hmm. changes in the scenery and stuff like that and Look, it's like okay is this is this still a rocky film at this point well i just think it's i i mean i applaud the impulse to do something different mm. but it's gilding the lily you don't need to be that creative with fight sequ- with boxing sequences yeah i just kind of want to see the boxing yeah done in a cool style style stylish way yeah you know? not stylized necessarily yeah like creed got it you know yeah um i mean the, the original rocky films especially the original it's down and do it's the way they boxed in the 70s yeah it feels 70s uh, so and that's what that's its appeal. Mm. Whereas Creed, it's slick and it's kind of, but it's not overdone. No, it's just it's nicely done. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the second film, but this is the same as the first one in the sense that Tessa Thompson's music fucking sucks. <laughs> At least see. she's not writing it now. No, she is writing it. She's not performing it. Oh yeah, yeah no, yeah. that's worse. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. now multiple people are performing her music. It's terrible. Yeah, it's meant to be, I guess, like uber cutting edge, trendy music. Yeah. I, well, I suppose it is. It sounds like modern music, which is like nothing at all. The boxing entrances are stupid. I know they're probably reflective of reality, <laughs> but God, they're stupid. Dame, which is Jonathan Major's nickname. Yeah. It doesn't really have the same inference here as it does in the States. No, yeah. <laughs> so it's, oh, Dame. <laughs> yeah, nothing like a Dame. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's some not great green screen. Yeah, is that just par for the course with... Like no, there's it like is it doesn't need to be like they're in the ring when they're in the ring. Yeah, um, in Jonathan May just like world heavyweight f- first. Fight. Yeah, it looked terrible. Mm. I just thought that was a bit weird. Yeah, don't get the Jonathan Majors thing, and I, I I don't care about Adonis the way that I cared about Rocky. Oh God, no! And that's the biggest problem. Yeah, I just don't. He's not as interesting. No, uh, he's not as root forable. So when you have like that pump up training montage. It doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. Because I don't really care if he wins or loses. Mm. 
Uh, I know they try, oh, he's got like a deaf kid and Tessa Thompson's going deaf and... But they kind of unwittingly make him less relatable. And so they do the Rocky IV thing of him running up to the top of the mountain. But in Rocky IV, right, the whole point of that montage, cheesy as it is, yeah. uh, with hearts on fire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's great, right? Yeah. 80s. But it, it's a very obvious contrast between the very institutional, slick, we're putting steroids in him, we're measuring everything, yeah. Drago, Soviet Drago. It's like we're training a machine in a factory. Exactly, yeah. He's just a product. It's always people watching him, like, make writing down notes on the yeah. clipboards. And then you've got Rocky on his own, avoiding the Russian security forces, yeah. chopping wood, growing a beard, you know, doing it the old-fashioned way. There are horses involved. Yeah. Uh, and then he runs to the top of this Russian peak, and Drago, he's the underdog. Even when he's the world champion, mm. He is deliberately putting himself back in. I'm an underdog now. I yeah. need to be that underdog. I need to leave behind all the comforts of... I need to leave behind the robot. <laughs> you know? I need to be in Siberia. Yeah. Whereas Adonis is by the Hollywood sign. And it's like, do you know what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, this isn't. This doesn't feel very underdoggy, does it? It's not a clever side-by-side. It's... He lives in the Hollywood yeah, Hills. Yeah, because, like, he's... Yeah, he's running up the Hollywood Hill and... Jonathan Majors is, like, training in, like, a gym with his boys. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's... He's the more Philly. Yeah, the exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If anyone's forgotten their roots. And I know that that's what kind of what the film's about, is that Jonathan Majors represents the kind of past he's trying to forget. Yeah. And he's got to get back in touch with that, like he's forgotten where he comes from. But then don't have him... Hollywood, unless that's the point you're making, but yeah. it's not the point the film no. is making. Yeah. It's just a mountain. Uh, yeah, it's got the mentor dying from Rocky Three. It's got the communications breakdown with the wife from all of them. It's got the <laughs> mountaintop scream from Rocky Four. And again, Rocky Four is objectively awful in every conceivable way. And it's, but it's also all, awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, it's yeah. one of the most best films. From the 80s. So yeah. don't invoke it lightly. No. Uh, yeah, The Hollywood Hills, it's like a, a, a fucking comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would have been Drago's peak. Yeah. If he had a peak, that would Oh, have God, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that would have worked, actually, if it was Drago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have conquered America, you know? Right. And they gesture toward the classic score, and I think it's clearly trying to carve out a new identity for itself as a franchise, which it should do. Mm. But then leave Rocky behind completely. Don't use any of the music. Which, the fact that he's not even in this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a... If you are trying to distinguish it from Rocky, then yeah, maybe it is time to not include Rocky. Then write your own fucking theme tune. But yeah, that's the thing. Write your own theme tune. Start your own... I know, like... Sing the theme tune. (laughs) It's his, like, character now, I guess. Yeah. And it is kind of his franchise, but it's still the Rocky franchise. Yeah, it's the, yeah, canon, canonically, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So he's always going to be anchored to that. So it doesn't feel like, unless he just starts something completely new, he's never going to be shot of it. It'll never escape the shadow of no. Rocky. No. And it's good you have, you know, a series, Rocky, Rocky 2, Rocky 3. Not the most sophisticated naming thing. And then you've got Creed. Like, okay. It's like Rocky. It's a mm. one-name thing. But they get Creed too. like, okay, you're pushing it. Yeah. I don't... Not more. Yeah. No, Creed would have been fine. Yeah. Uh, and then Creed 3. And then Creed 3, and now there'll be a Creed 4. Yeah. It's perfectly okay and perfectly forgettable. Yeah. In Toto. Yeah. That's what it comes down I have to. no... I have no recommendation. For no, I, w- I wouldn't recommend it, but it's not terrible. It's just nothing. We're not... Gonna, it's exactly like 2. We're not going to remember it. No. At all. The o- like the only thing I can say about it is that it made me want to watch the original Creed again. Okay, yeah. But not because it's like, oh, this franchise makes me feel warm. I want to kind of re-experience it's it. It's not oh more of this, it's other than this. Yeah, yeah, it's like this used to be good at one point. I need to remember why. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's Creed 3. That's Creed 3. Right. Should we review season one of The Last of Us? Okay, let's do that. Right. So, I'm actually familiar with the games, having watched playthroughs. Yeah, this kind of... This show sort of uh, had an impact on you, didn't it? In the sense well, that pre. it... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. After years of protest, <laughs> you decided to finally give gaming a bit of a chance, didn't you? In terms of, yeah, watching playthroughs yeah. and walkthroughs. Uh, yeah, I get just that completest in me of, like... I thought, oh, I'll watch... I know The Last of Us unfolds cinematically. Yeah. So I'll watch it so I know what, you know, um, not necessarily to compare the show, but just so I know what the show's doing, I suppose. Yeah. And I thought, well, I've watched that. 
I can I might as well watch everything. That's <laughs> all me. the video that's games. That's my personality. Yeah. Uh, well, do yeah. you, I mean, this is something I was going to say is that, like I know that you were already kind of aware that there was cinematic storytelling in video games. Yeah, of course. You're yeah. already a fan of Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. You're already a fan of the, G- of the GTAs. You know that stuff's out there. Yeah. But I guess like for people that don't necessarily know that. Mm-hmm. Do you think The Last of Us... Maybe this is not... Maybe this is too early to ask this question. Mm. Because the question is, like, do you think this is going to serve as a gateway to people that didn't necessarily know that? Right. Where they, they, like, see this and go, oh, this was a video game? I'm going to have to see what video games are now. You know? Uh... No. No? But that's not nothing to do with the quality of either product. I think it's just the people that don't know it's a video game are going to be like my father and my mother yeah. who aren't going to play how, no matter how good it is. Yeah. You know, so everyone though, everyone knows it's a video game, right? Like, oh, the, yeah, the, like of a certain yeah. age. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I think everyone in general because that's part yeah. of the marketing. Is... Well, my mother and my father wouldn't have known. Okay. You know, because that's just that I show it to them. Yeah. I, I told them it's from a game, but they, you know, they need reminding constantly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. my, my mother watched it and that was something that like, she watched it more with my sister than with me. I yeah. kind of watched it on my own at like, yeah. a different time. But um, yeah, I think that was a common question for her. It's like, so how does this work in the game? Right, right, right. Like, is this just, are you playing this? Or yeah, does yeah. this happen between the bits you play? Like, it's, yeah, yeah it's interesting it. seeing someone who doesn't, who like stopped paying attention to games after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Having to catch up to all the advancements they've kind of made. Well, kind of for me, it was more just about, um, like I, I'd seen The Last of Us being played when it first came out, like a bit, like maybe an hour of it. Mm. And like I said, I knew it unfolded very, it was very narratively heavy. So I thought it'd be an easy thing to watch. And uh, it was more just, again, not necessarily to compare and contrast, just, it would be interesting to see what the show was avoiding doing mm. and what it was choosing to do instead. Yeah. Basically, all to say that that's not going to factor into my review of the... Okay. Really factor into it at all. I don't, I'm not interested in its faithfulness to the source material. No. That's not something that I care about. I don't have a relationship with the game, no. as a lot of people do. I don't care about that. I just care about being a good show. Mm. So episode one and two, let's do it together. Okay. The first two episodes get us off to a very good start. Mm. Pilot is very impressive, mm. uh, especially the prologue. Uh, Nico Parco plays his daughter, is endearing to mm. her banter and precociousness, which is, will be a recurring theme, Yeah, are much better embodied than they are with Bella Ramsey. Okay. It's a shame that she's in it for as little as she is. Because I thought she was really good. Yeah. That's definitely... I mean, you could say that about most of the characters in the show, right? Like, oh, they had to get Joel right. They had to get Ellie right. Yeah. I think the daughter really is someone that they couldn't yeah. afford to screw up. I agree. Because that's the whole foundation. Because I, I would say Joel is the main character. Of, is, certainly yeah. of this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, going forward, I know that, like, in the second one... It's going to be Ellie. Yeah. It's going to be Ellie. But, like, in this season, it's very much Joel's show. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think if you don't get her right, he doesn't work as a character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it is really nice that like a character as delicate as that, where it's like supposed to be this young girl who's like beyond her years, because mm-hmm. that's something that frustrates us in particular. I don't yes. know how like broadly speaking how people respond to it, but yeah, if you get like, those like young girl characters in particular. Mm-hmm. That are like you know wise beyond their years, and they're more capable than the adults. It's like oh fuck off, yeah. Well, so we'll go of the fuck to, away from me, you know. <laughs> Trust me, we will get to that. <laughs> okay, but she was good, as you but, said. But she was very good, yeah. And she's she's Tandy Newton's daughter. Well, I didn't know, but you can. Well, yeah, you know, now you, you know, said that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, the pre-title scenes were great for the first two episodes. I don't know why they stopped. It, it really upset me. <laughs> I, you know, I really liked it. Like that we're expanding upon the world. Yeah. And like you can do this with a TV show. Yeah, absolutely. I know you just said like at the beginning that like you're not going to, you don't care about this as an adaptation because you had no prior relation to, relationship to the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, I, I don't care whether it's faithful or not. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like for me, the stuff that, Again, I don't know if I'm playing my hand too early here, but the stuff that I resonated the most with with this show were the moments where it wasn't faithful. The moments where it was yes. adding to that world. Yes. And especially since it's the first two episodes, it feels like the show is setting you up to say, like, right... It's not exactly going to be the game. Yeah, and we're going to, like, contextualise this for you. 
Yeah. You know, that first... I think that first scene in that first episode on that kind of like 60s mm-hmm. chat show, it's really, really good because I think that helps just kind of like set the tone for the horror elements of the show really, really well. Because mm-hmm. like in the game, it's like, oh, you know, because I'm actually physically playing it, the infected are a like genuine threat to like the character mm-hmm. and they're a force that I have to overcome. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same with like the human, uh, the hostile humans as well. But in the show, the fact that it's like rooting it in a reality for the audience. Yeah. I know there's that kind of like, the, you know, that little climate change message that they've yeah, thrown yeah, in, yeah. But, the, but they're actually like properly going like, you know, this isn't some like fictional virus. This mm. is a thing that exists now. Yes. And we are presenting to you an incredibly pause- plausible reality mm-hmm. in which this thing is going to fucking destroy humanity. Well, I don't know how plausible it is, but yes, like... It, it, like it the felt, logic, Yeah, yes, the logic that they plausible. give you, it's like, oh, fuck, that could happen. That feels like that could happen. Yes, and they... That opening scene instilled a confidence in me. Yeah. Because I like the look of it as well. Yeah. That the show would expand upon the mythology and chart its own path. Yeah. Um, and I think, especially because considering how infrequently the infected ended up showing up, yeah, it focuses a lot more on the human. Uh, I guess, which I guess is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but considering how infrequently they show up, it did a really good job of like making them feel scarier. Yes, because it's like, oh yeah, this is like, yeah, this is they've made this real for me now. You know? Well, yeah, like I, said, I, I miss those pre-titles when they weren't there anymore. Yeah, definitely. and, and bolstered by the second one as well, where. Because that's always the criticism of zombie um, shows or stories, isn't it? It's like, why don't you just kill the first zombie? Right. And it's fine. But they bring that woman in and she's like, we'll kill who's the one that spread the virus. Mm. And they're like, we have no idea. But it's like, it's the same with COVID. Isolate the first person that got it. Well, yeah. by the time you know it's out there. Yeah. And they're like, well, there are 16 candidates and all of them have ex- have exposed themselves to the public long before we got to them. Right. This virus is out there in the city. There's nothing we can... And she's like, just fucking bomb, bomb the, city. the city. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck. Like, you, you, yeah, they do a really, really good job of making the whole thing feel so grounded that it becomes, like, yeah, actually intimidating. And then it just goes away. It just stops, yeah. It stops. It's so strange to me. So the title sequence is sound. It's a good title uh, sequence. Good. I like it. It has, that the show in general has that clean HBO gold standard cinematography. Yeah. I love the ending of the pilot with um, Never Let Me Down Again by Depeche Mode. Yeah. That was really great. Episode two is basically plot advancement, yeah, uh, which is perfectly fine. The Indonesian teaser is great. They are clearly Indonesian. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things. Uh, the clicker scene is effective. The world is well designed, uh, and you come to take that for granted after a while. Yeah. I think Pedro Pascal is solid. He does exactly as he should. He's a great case study. Oh, look at it! What an episode of case studies. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he's a great example of casting someone outside of the race of the... Yeah. And it works. Like Where it's he, irrelevant. He, yeah. It, his yeah. race is irrelevant to this. He was absolutely the right fit for Joel. Yeah, this thing. It's not an outstanding performance, as in, because like, the role doesn't... It doesn't demand it. The character's yeah. taciturn nature doesn't lend itself to it being... Yeah. That kind of performance. But he understands the character. He understands it. He's reliable. Yeah. He, he, when he's on screen, there's no, like, anxiety about, no. oh, what's he going to do? You know? Yeah. I kind of wanted to delay the criticisms for as long as possible because there's, okay. like, there's a lot of good to say, but it's such a fundamental issue for me that I can't skirt around it for a long time. Okay. Bella Ramsey's a problem for me. Right. A real problem for me. She's grating. Her precociousness, as Ellie is in the game, mm. feels completely affected. As in both hers and Ellie's? No, Bella Ramsey... The, 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 Ellie's precociousness in the show mm. feels like an affected performance. Okay. I don't mean in a good way, like, oh, it's a kid trying to act older than that. I mean, I feel like I'm watching someone act. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I don't mean the character is putting up shields. I mean, the whole thing feels like somebody acting. It's such a shame that she's so central to the whole enterprise because <laughs> I could overlook it otherwise. But she single-handedly knocks the show down a star for me. Oh, shit. This could have, could have been a five-star show. Mm. And because of her, it's four. People, people like Bella Ramsey. I don't well. get it. It's got nothing to do with how she looks, even though she does look like a foot. Um, <laughs> it's got nothing to do. It's it's just like her when she's like biting her nail, that thing that she does quite a lot, mm. and like she's really pondering things. I just hate her. Okay. I really hate her in the show. She's not the worst. No, 
but I really don't like her. And it's got nothing to do with that bugbear about precocious kids, because Ellie, this is where I will compare, in the game, I didn't find it annoying. I thought it worked well, that she's swearing and mm. all that kind of thing. Not Bella Ramsey. No. I don't think she can pull it off. Okay. I think she's a bit too young. I think she's a bit... I know... How old is Bella Ramsey? I was going to say, she's five years older than the character she's playing. Because I think she's 19. She's 19? She's 19, but uh, Ellie's 14. And she looks 12. Yeah. Or 11. Mm. And she's always going to look like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so they all... Well, there you go. That kind of explains it. They cast someone that's going to look young Mm. for a while. Because uh, that look isn't going to change. But you can find good, like, what was the name of the the actress in Logan? Daphne Keene. Daphne Keene. She yeah. was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can you can get a young-looking actor or even a child actor that can act. Well, Nico Parker. Uh, Nico Parker as well. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's not that necessarily. It's her. Yeah. Okay, so it's not that she's too young. But it feels like someone who's too young. It feels like someone who's 11 that's being told right you've got to swear and like this is how you got to be in this scene right and they're trying it on uh i'm really surprised that she's 19 okay that to me is like a oh she should be much better than she is then right i don't know i don't know i, I don't think saying like it feels like she's trying it on i don't love the phrasing of that because to me that kind of implies that it's like she's she's not done it before and so there's like an unfamiliarity yeah with like there's a disconnect in her performance because like she's not it looks like she's not used to doing the things that she's doing. But that's what it feels like. But no, I think she does. Like when she's, what, that first scene where she like kicks the food tray away and when yeah. she does swear at people, it doesn't feel like this is unfamiliar territory to her. But I agree with you. It doesn't yeah. feel right. It doesn't yeah, yeah. feel like, yeah, I think especially later episodes of the season where Ellie does take a bit more focus. Mm. That's the weakest part of the show. Yes. In fact, I think the worst episode we'll come to it. is something that we share, yeah, yeah. which we will come to. Yeah. But yeah, there's this. There is something wrong with her performance. I, I I just can't put my finger on it personally. Well, I I'm, I think it's that. I think that it like to me it was like a trying too hard to seem older than her years. Yeah. And like the swearing thing is cute and all that kind of thing, and it's not. Mm. And I think part of it is that it's the show. The show has the expectation that you're coming with a oh I'm gonna like. Ellie and Joel, like that relationship is really like what I'm in it for. And because a lot of people are coming from the game and they're going to have that relationship. Yeah. There's a lot of people that it doesn't matter what they were like, they were going to like Ellie and Joel because they like Ellie and Joel. Yeah. Like done. And I think there is, there is some presumption in how the show unfolds, but no, you're going to like them. I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's fair because... If that were the case, the show wouldn't have extended the prologue with the daughter. I don't think it would have. I think it would have just... That would have played out... Fair, like, they wouldn't have spent the time building that character. Oh, you mean in terms of Joel? Yeah, because Joel, it really does feel like the show's going, right, here is Joel. Here's who Joel is. Here's what happens to Joel. Here's how it fucks him yeah, up. Yeah, but here's the, here's the irony. And then Ellie just literally just uh, is in the episode all of a sudden. Yeah, but the irony is that I think... I don't think I needed that opening sequence to be what it was to like Joel. There's such a massive gap of time between that. It's 20 years between the prologue and the show. And it's not like she's often invoked. It's just like, it's kind of, he's a certain type of character and you know, that's why. Yeah. But I wasn't like thinking of her often through the show. I think the irony is that if they hadn't had that opening sequence, but it was just explained why he was the way he was, I would still feel exactly the same way. Because he's a good actor mm. playing the character well. Mm. So it's it's an ironic thing. So I'm not, yeah, I, I don't think, look, I think that prologue is just a really good prologue with a good child actor doing their thing. And it works. Like their relationship works. It was cast well. They had chemistry. And I think the show is presuming upon the chemistry between Ellie and Joel. Mm. And that's going to carry it. And I don't think necessarily that it's there. But that's not Pedro Pascal's fault. It's Bella Ramsey's fault. And a bit of the show. Okay. Because it, it, that's what the show is. Gonna, well, you're going to like those two. I don't mean like them individually. But like it, them together. You're going to yeah. like them together. But it has to, right? Presume it. No, it has to earn it. No, but at some point it, ha- it just has to go, right, well, at this point the audience will like these two together. Yes. And I think actually when that point comes, it doesn't feel right. Okay. There, there is a point where th- there's a watershed point. Mm. 
And when it happened, I didn't buy it. And I think it's because of that. that the show hadn't done enough of a good job uh, with those two together. He's a great character. Uh, well, not a great. He's a good character. But yeah. He played really well. Yeah. It's not him. But those two... I mean, we'll get to that moment. You, so you'll see what I'm talking about. But mm. let's talk about episode three first. Yeah. Let, let, yeah, let's, let's yeah, yeah, lighten it up a bit, it. shall yeah, yeah. we? <laughs> so Gustavo Santoalala, who did the score for the game... Yes. And does the score for the show... He's an at least twice Oscar-winning composer. Mm. He did uh, Babel and Brokeback Mountain. Ah, okay. Uh, which leads us into episode three. Ah, uh, okay, um, all right. Well, no, because just to get out of the way, there is a melody in the episode that's very reminiscent of the Brokeback Mountain score. Okay. Very reminiscent. You think that's deliberate? Well, I don't know. It's the same few notes in the same order. Yeah. It, and it was a bit distracting given the overlaps. Yes. But I'm a big fan of Brokeback Mountain, and it probably isn't an issue for anyone else. Okay. Episode three is very good. Yeah. Best episode of the season? Yes. Yeah, I would say so too. Uh, it's not important. No. Like in, you know, air quotes, cult. It's not socially important. But you can say that it's a good hour of television without claiming that it's socially significant. Yeah. Well, again, this is an example of the show deviating a bit from the source material, but not failing to understand mm-hmm. the source material or at least the world the source material takes place in yeah this story absolutely feels like it belongs yeah it does yeah yeah and it was yeah and it was just a nice surprise I suppose well it was like the headlines were oh it's the best episode of tw- early contender for best episode of 2023 yeah now other than like it's a bit premature I'm sure it will be for a lot of people the best episode of 2023 but that's recently been beaten so yeah they, they can't- they can't say that. Yeah. So firstly, hold the presses. Mm. Secondly, this is coming from a majority of people who understandably can't possibly keep up with all of the TV out there. Yeah. So just rein it in a <laughs> bit. There's something really satisfying about seeing someone create a self-sufficient town. Yes. Just that like routine of like seeing a procedure yeah. happen on screen, you know? Yeah, well, it really does feel like it's the first, uh, like, like you're kind of... It's not like, oh, I'm, yeah, it feels like I'm there with him building the town. Mm. But yeah, you do kind of, it gets you thinking, doesn't it? Yeah, how would I do things yeah. in what order? Yeah, yeah. yeah, could I, am I capable of doing that? Is that how I would do it? Right, power, generators, yeah. animals, Has plants. he thought of everything? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he has covered everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad they didn't feel compelled to show a graphic sex scene. Mm. It is HBO after all, they can do that. Yeah. And this, that's not necessarily anything homophobic. Mm. I think it would have just cheapened it. I think yeah. it really would have. Because yeah, uh, it it's a love story. Yeah. And, and though you can have love stories with sex, obviously, but I don't know. It would have made it less sweet if you'd just seen them bang it. Yeah, it, no, you know. I, no, I completely yeah. agree. And I, yeah, and I think that's true regardless of uh, the fact that it's too much. Absolutely. As well, yeah. My only real critique of the episode is that Nick Hoffman has been getting most of the praise and I thought Murray Bartlett was better. <laughs> I thought the other guy was better. I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it? Because that is a duo that has chemistry. Absolutely. In that show. And so it's, it's, it's impossible to know at certain times who is bouncing off who. Like, who's, who's the, the core of this scene? Yeah. And which one is kind of bouncing off it? Well, I think it's part of it is because Nick Offman... I mean, Mary Barlett is gay. Yeah. And Nick Offman is being seen as playing against type, even though he actually isn't really. He's playing gay, mm. which is against type. But but no, he's he's, he's he is playing, the Kaufman. <laughs> he's playing a dramatic Ron Swanson who's gay. Like yeah. that's what he's doing. Uh, they, but they're both very good performances. It's just, it's a tiny niggle that I've ha- that I have. Yeah. Neither are oh my god like outstanding, but they're really good. Yeah. And unfortunately, Nick Offman is a certain type that doesn't lend itself easily to diverse roles. Yeah. In Fargo, like on paper, Fargo, kind of nervous, vaguely incompetent conspiracy theorist uh, lawyer. Mm. But it's Nick Offerman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, doing a bit of a Minnesota accent. Yeah. You, you can't disagree with the criticism that it doesn't advance the story much. No, but is that necessarily a problem? No, not for me. But if people were to say that, I can't disagree with it. Yeah. It's just whether, whether that matters to you or not, and it doesn't matter to me. It is a tangent. It's whether you care about that. And the series, this, this is the thing, is going to have to do this. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, yeah, it's not. It doesn't necessarily advance the plot. No. Um, all it really does in the grand scheme of things is it gives Joel and Ellie transport. That's all it does. Yeah. But it exists within the 
the story that like it, it has a place in the story that we're, we've already been told. Mm-hmm. Like there are things in previous episodes that get explained by the existence of these characters. Yes, these characters do interact with the main characters in flashbacks. They they are rooted in this world, and mm-hmm. it does a lot to help bring you into. I know it's the third episode. It's like, well, we should be invested in the yeah, world by yeah, this yeah. point. But it does good, do a good job of like bringing you into that world a bit more. Mm-hmm. So it's like, even though it doesn't necessarily advance the plot, it's not perfunctory. It's not pointless. No, no, it's not pointless. And it's just a really good story. Self-contained story, well told. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, very well, Lindelofian. Yeah, it's very Lindelofian. Yeah, that's the thing. You could watch yeah. this episode in isolation. It's like the third episode of The Leftovers, which mm. is thematically a compliment it's the matt episode it doesn't really go much past that yeah anywhere past that episode but i i know like on the um was it the chernobyl podcast or maybe it was the leftovers for the hbo hbo did a podcast for one of those shows and craig mazin and lindelof were together one like talking to the other about this show i just can't remember which was which okay but they do know each other and they're friends, so I wouldn't be surprised right. if Lindelof um, was a consultant. Let's oh, say. Okay, I'm not like it's all amazing. I'm not saying, but you know, it reminded me a lot of okay of of Lindelof. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be possible to put the game on TV to just transplant it. Oh no, to TV. yeah, yeah. There's too much uh, filler. Yeah, with its stealth component and finding things and. A lot of it's about the environments and how you navigate it, like with the ladders and all that kind of thing. It's going to have to do these cutaway character stories. Yeah. And I'm okay with that, if they're all like episode three. Yeah. But they're not, are they? But we'll get to it. Okay. Oh, we're still not there yet. We're still not there yet. Okay. I wondered a lot about how different the show would be if it wasn't so loyal to the games. Like they had the premise, but they could do their own thing. Mm. And this essentially completely original episode shows what it could be like. Mm. You know, I love the sitcom aspect of the double date dynamic. Oh, yeah. Like Frank and Tess get on like a house on fire, but the two more masculine guys dance around each other. Yeah. And this manifest is built openly holding him at gunpoint <laughs> <laughs> at the dinner yeah. table. Yeah. I love that. It was just little things for me. Like, I love the li- when they're a bit older, when they're toward the end. Yeah. The little wink that Bill gives Frank. Like, he's, he's painted, he's now mob- immobile in a chair and he's painting. Yeah. And uh, Bill is, like, tending to the garden and he just, like, gives him a little wink. Like, that's, it's, it was love. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, through love. I love the song that's, that runs throughout the episode. Yeah. And the final shot is iconic. I'm always going to remember that final shot. Yeah. And what it implies, you know? Mm. Yeah, a lot of the show is Lindelofian. It reminds me of Watchmen in certain ways. The pace, the world building. And I know it's that episode. Uh, not to its detriment. It's just very obviously self-contained. It's very obviously self-contained story, quality drama episode. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's always the bottle episodes and the self-contains that, as we said, end up being the best. But, but this is a good example. Well, I mean, the, like when you were talking about it earlier, you were talking about like the problem now is that they feel contrived. Their existence yes. feels contrived. They were designed to be that. This doesn't feel like it was designed to be... Like, it felt like... I can see this being arrived at naturally. In a sense, like, oh, the first place they stop is Bill and Frank, so we... But I think it, it is a little bit contrived, and this is an, an assumption, in the sense that... You know when George Bus was outside the Twin Towers after they'd been demolished? And... Um, Go on. <laughs> he has the... Uh, the the megaphone, and then someone goes, oh, we can't hear you, and he goes, yeah. but I hear you. And he has that look on his face like, oh, that was a fucking moment. Like, that I didn't set up. And I bet they had a similar thing when they realised they're gay. Uh, <laughs> we've got a fucking bottle episode and a half here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm not saying they did. But that's, that's, and they nailed it. I'm yeah. Not, it's really great. But that's the thing. That, that was arrived at. Yes. Like, they probably didn't say, right, we're going to do a last of a show. The Bill and Frank episode is going to be this self. It's, it no, wasn't but the it, But thing. it does feel like any opportunity to be diverse they really jump on it. So in the game, it's like alluded to that they were gay. Yeah. And then it's kind of proven when she finds the gay porn mag and yeah. you know, like his emotional reaction to him is like, oh, fuck him then, you know. Yeah. They, they've done some, they go the opposite way. The two don't fall out. Like it's a genuine Romeo and Juliet mm. kind of love story. But even without the tragedy, like it's sad, but it's a happy ending in yeah. a way. Yeah. It's just this lovely little story. But the fact that they, it was alluded to they were gay, they obviously went, right, 
we are doing gay. Yeah. You know? Uh, anyway, that's episode three. Really good. Yes. Really good. Okay, episode four, five, and six. Oh, okay. Speed up now. Well, because they, they are kind of just, let's get things moving. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they get a move on episodes. The first egregious example is in episode four of Replicating the Game, uh, which is the editing of um, her falling asleep. Like, I'm not tired, and then the cut to her being asleep. Oh, right, okay. Uh, which is lifted directly from the game. Yeah, well, yeah, it, there have been other examples. Like, the interaction in with the daughter when she, like, gives him the watch. And oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. broken. That is shot exactly the same as Okay, well. okay. Well, the, the, I think this is the first one I noticed, because okay. that's a, a memorable cut. Yes, know? yeah. Whenever this happens, which is principally in this episode and the finale, it's really jarring to me. It's interesting, isn't it? Because... Yeah, whenever that happens, not necessarily like in concept, this is similar mm-hmm. to the game, or even just moments where the dialogue is lifted. It's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, it's from the game. When it's literally like, oh, that's the it's game. Edited the same. Yeah, yeah, it's edited the same. It's shot the same. It takes me out the show completely. And it's really interesting because it's like, well, it is an adaptation. Mm-hmm. This is well within the boundary of what's expected from it. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting that in this instance, it's it has that effect on me where yeah, it doesn't ruin the show, but. I'm suddenly aware that I'm watching a show when yes, I see that. I I agree with that. I think one would probably benefit from having no familiarity with the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The Henry and Sam stuff is fine. Yeah. The brother stuff when he's with the they're with the brother that's fine mm-hmm. in their community. That's kind of all I've got to say about. They're fine, decent. They're moving the plot forward episodes. Yeah. There's nothing. There was nothing stand out about them for me. Other than they made um, Sam deaf, which he isn't in the game. Yes. Which, again, feels like, a, oh, we could do something with that, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, they're in a world where... I mean, one of yeah, the... Yeah, you one, know, it added to it. Yeah, one of the, the major enemies they face is an enemy that hunts via sound. Yes. And you've got a deaf character. Yeah, yeah, It yeah. makes perfect sense. But it, it made like the two closer as well. Because not, not many people could communicate with Sam. Yeah. So it made the brothers closer. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, episode seven. Are we, are we here? Yeah. Oh, we're here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> uh, I really do understand how people could get frustrated by the diversions from the plot. I embrace them if they're good. This is not one of those examples. No. It's of next to no interest to me. No. And I, I really mean that. You- In fact, I watched The Last of Us with my father. Yes. And I skipped episode seven without telling him. Oh, see, really? To see if he noticed. And he didn't. Wow, okay. Because episode six Was ends... Was he watching the show? Just well, think, give it the benefit of the doubt. Episode, Was he actually watching? Episode six ends with Joel being stabbed. Yeah. And episode eight starts with, like, he's been patched up, but he's still, like, out of it. And they've been in this house for a while, which is perfectly within the remit of what the show would do anyway. Yeah. So, no, you miss nothing. Okay. Nothing at all. Because you said to me before, that, like, there is, in the most charitable of yeah. universes... This episode does have a point. Right. In that it kind of explains a character beat for Ellie that the show has kind of already explained. Well, this is... Yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll get to that. Because um, I was going to say, other than that, this is what episode three could have been if it was done badly. Yes. In that it has literally no... There's literally no point to it. Right. Except gay. Yeah. But you've, like, but you've already had that. So it's like gay... But Ellie, but, well, lesbian then. Yeah, or but... bisexual, whatever the fuck she is. I'm yeah, sure. but like... But we've done this... You've yeah, had your moment. I know. It was the whole episode of wandering around a mall. That's what it was. And because it's a tangent, it makes it particularly grating. Mm. You know? This is the worst episode, yeah. I think. Oh, absolutely. By this point in the show, this is the point. We've taken it as given that Ellie wouldn't leave Joel yeah. behind. There's enough of a bond now, especially... So in episode six... He's going to leave her with the brother. Exactly, yeah. And she's like, everyone's left me. And now you're going to fucking leave me. And then he says, well, it's your choice. And she stays with him. Yeah. I didn't need an hour of television to contextualize a decision that I already knew she would have made. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, genuinely. That's it. So all it has to go, all that it can offer me is a really great self-contained story. Yeah. Which it didn't. Yeah, because what else could this episode, what else could this episode have served? Like in terms of like its existence? You've got that moment, which is like, yeah, that is genuinely what it's well, doing. Well, Ellie refers to uh, that she's, she's killed before. Yeah. And we now see who. Yeah, we don't... Yeah, we see who. We don't, yeah, we don't see her doing it, but we see that it would have been... It would have hit her emotionally. Yeah. But we already got that, that yeah. she had a friend called Riley that she, you know... Yeah. 
I know that already. Yeah. I know the people have had to do horrible, heinous shit in this, in that, the world of the show. Mm. It, it, uh, genuinely, it's to introduce the idea that she isn't straight. But we knew this already, right? Did we? Um, okay. Well, I, obviously, I'm coming from the perspective of someone that is familiar with these characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prior to the show. Yeah. Not necessarily a fan of the game, just like I, I played it, I yeah, knew it, yeah, and yeah. I knew what to expect. Two it, is a fucking drudge in it. But go on. <laughs> Oh, I can't... I, in a way, I can't wait for two. Yeah. Because it's just fucking miserable. It's so miserable. And I, I want to see how they fix it. Because they do need to fix it. Two, the Last of Us Part 2 is one of the most divisive games that's come out in recent memory. Yeah. Because there are people that genuinely, unironically, will put it at the top of, like, best games of all times list. It was. It was number one on one list I saw. Yeah. And then there are other people, sensible people, yeah. who think it's borderline unplayable. Well, I think, I'm trying to remember what they said when it was at number one. It was like, look, like it or lump it, this did more to advance gaming than any other game in history. Yeah. Now, I don't know what that's... I, f- well, no, I, it didn't. I intuitively feel that's not true. Yeah, it's, it's um, absolute bollocks. But, like, graphics-wise, it's fucking amazing. It's, still, it's not... I, I, no, I would no, say I, it, it's not even the most impressive graphics jump of its generation. No, no, I'm not even saying a jump. I'm just get, giving it its due. Yeah. It looks amazing. Yeah. The first one looks amazing. The second one looks even better. Yeah. I... It's, it's just more horrible to look at because it's bleaker. Yeah. Uh, and everything about it is bleaker and it's yeah. not as interesting and it's not as anything as the first yeah, one. Yeah, Ellie is less likable. Joel yeah. has done a hell of a disservice. Yeah. It's spe- it's way too fucking long and I don't think there's a single redeemable character in the entire plot. Well, it doesn't really know what... It feels like it doesn't know what it is. So, like, the first game, even though it's post-apocalyptic and, like, it's, oh, we've got to do horrible stuff in the post-apocalypse that relationship between Ellie and Joel carries it. Yeah. It's not the kind of show, uh, game rather, where it's bleak in that particular way. Mm. Where it kills off the main character in such a violent, disposable way. Yeah. Like, Sons of Anarchy did that. Mm. And for that show, unlike The Shield, where they were like unrelentingly, they could do things like that. Yeah. And you go, oh, Jesus, that was fucking dark. Yeah. But that those shows exist in an incredibly dark universe. Mm. And The Last of Us, for all of its post-apocalyptic stuff, doesn't. Mm. It's not as dark as that. It's just not as dark as that. No. Even when you get the fucking cannibals in the next episode. Yeah. It doesn't go that dark. The way Joel is disposed of in the second game is just miserable. Yeah. It's not dark, it's miserable. Yeah. You, you it's know? interesting watching people's reaction to it yeah. as well, because... I think the brutality, the brutality of it is obviously supposed to be... The, I think the idea is that it's supposed to be gut-wrenching. Yeah, yeah. And it does put you in the same position as Ellie, where it's like, right, the person who did this, they're fucking dead. I will, I will hunt them to the edge yeah, yeah. of the universe yeah. to avenge Joel. But watching people's reactions to it, people mm. got angry about it. Well, that's they were what, like, how yeah. fucking dare you do that to that's Joel? Like, I don't, I'm not connected to it, so I didn't have any emotional reaction either way. But it, it's not sad. Mm. It's not sad when he's killed. It's just like kind of disgusting, but not in the way that you that it should be. Yeah. It's like yeah, anger is would be the correct response if you, if you're really into those games. Yeah. It'd be why would you do that? Yeah. That's just because it's like um, gratuitous. Mm. That's why because it feels gratuitous. It's like you've done that for its for the sake of it. Yeah. To be shocking mm. and to. Uh, as an exemplar of, oh, look how brutal it is in this world. But like, I kind of knew that. I didn't, yeah. you didn't need to do that in that way, you know. And thematically, it's not that interesting. Like, oh, a character that you, you know, he's killed people and you forget that they have families that, yeah, you know, bull- it's bullshit. Yeah, anyway, yeah. That's so, so no, it'll be interesting to see how, more interesting because Neil Druckmann is sort of co-showrunner, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if Craig Mazin... I don't know what Craig Mazin thinks of The Last of Us Part 2, mm-hmm. but I know Neil Druckmann is immensely proud of it. So I'm, I'll be interested to see what becomes of that. Yeah. And whether he's going to have to be taken down a peg or two to be like, right, Neil, it sucks. It's miserable. you got to ruin no, it. No, I don't think. I think he's in, I think he's in deference to um, right. Neil Druckmann. Yeah. I think he's like he's Alan Moore and this is Watchmen and right. He's an Uber like they said after Chernobyl, right? What do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want to, I want to do The Last of Us. Mm. And the second game existed already. Yeah. So yeah, I think he's like, I'm honored, I'm blessed to have this property. That's the vibe I get from him. Yeah. And they they've already said it's going to be two seasons now of part two, and that's it. That's it done. Yeah. 
which is like, why bother? Why bother doing it at all then? Because they're not. It's not different enough to justify a whole fucking TV show. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, and it seems like their intention is not to do a Game of Thrones, where it's like right now we chart our own path. But even with Game of Thrones, they only did that because they overtook mm. the author. I think that is there going to be a Last of Us Part Three? Yeah, they said that they're there thinking is, about uh, it. Maybe then, I, but I don't know. As far as I know, they've said no. Seasons two and three will be the second game, mm. and that's kind of it's finite. We know where we're going. We know yeah. where we're ending. So yeah. So episode seven. Yeah, I don't know what that was a tangent from, but I felt like Nor do I was I. starting to make a point, and then we got angry about the last of us part two. Well, my last point there was that it's a lot to get to one line that contextualizes a decision that literally everybody would have already assumed she would have made. Yeah. So there's that. Oh yeah, I think it's like what what what's the point of this episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that. Um, it's well, so it shows how she was bitten. Yeah. Do Which, I... you, no, you don't need it. No. I'm literally thinking like, what gaps does it fill in? But uh, let's be honest, that she's bitten. Mm. We see this. Oh yeah, that's what it was. I said I was already familiar with the characters. Ah, oh, right, right, right. So I okay. knew the character was gay. Yeah. And there are hints that there are thrown hints. in. There are hints. Like she says, oh, some of her boys early on. She's like, yeah. yeah, I'm not really into that. And I don't know if you're not familiar with Ellie prior to the show, yeah. whether those hints are too subtle. I don't think they were. I think no. you totally would have got that she's gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regardless. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think it serves that function where it's like, oh, this character's gay. I never knew that, you know? Yes. Yeah, an hour of TV for those tiny yeah, exactly, little things. Yeah. If a story is gripping and well told, fine. Again, episode three, but not here. No. And also it's not like, it doesn't feel like it's it serves a function of, look how this incident changed Ellie. No. Because the Ellie no. that we see in that flashback is the exact same Ellie exactly that we know the throughout same. the rest of the show. Exactly the same, yeah. yeah. But they, again, they were trying to do a little love, a cute teenage love story with two girls. Yeah. Look at the representation. Again, it, it, those that's what bothers me. The thing that bothers me, other than Bella Ramsey's performance, the most about The Last of Us is those things. Where they, my sense, and maybe it, I don't know, it's a complete like interpretation, is that when they had a chance to be quote unquote diverse they fucking ran really ran with it mm. you know what I mean yeah we'll do an hour lesbian thing we'll do an hour gay thing <laughs> and I don't have a problem with those because like I said episode 3 is amazing but it just feels opportunistic and a bit uh, I, yeah. in a way this this one made more sense because this is an adaptation of post game DLC yeah. yeah a prequel to the game but it came out after the game did mm-hmm. and it's like oh we finally have the chance to properly integrate this into the story of The Last of Us 1. Yes. But, I, I mean, you know, the fact that this was written after that story was written, it shows it's, that it's, it's like... It's the DLC walking around a mall. I think so. See, that's what... that's what The one thing that winds me up about those kinds of games, like you said, isn't Last of Us considered, like, Oscar bait to some degree? To a lot of people, yeah. when, when it came out, yeah, it was called um, Video Game Oscar bait. Yeah. And I... I, I I, I I think I know where you're going with this. Where it's like this. It's not. Yeah. No. I think the Last of Us isn't. The game isn't. It's like it, it, I think it would be fun to play. Yeah. It just also has that kind of oh, it's a story. But that is Oscar bait shit. Where yeah. it's like indie gaming. Oh, you're just walking around a thing and you're talking to each other and I want to play a game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm less familiar with the Left yeah, Behind yeah. DLC. I don't know if it is just that. My impression is it's just that. I could be wrong. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think at the time it was called Lost. I, I think it was because of its tone yeah. and the maturity of its presentation. Because at the time, a lot of AAA games weren't behaving like that. Right. They are now. Like, most games that come out nowadays are tonally, or at least in their kind of core presentation, they're very akin to The Last yes. yes. God of War is a perfect example. Yes. You look at how that franchise started as this kind of spectacle slasher. Yeah. And then the last two... It's Kratos and his son hunting through the wilderness, and it's very Last of Us, where it's like it's their relationship. I think that mo- a lot of modern gaming could be condensed to the song "Getting to Know You," but in like an eight-bit version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it should be. Yeah, there are a lot of precocious kids in the show. Um, Storm Reed is the worst. Is that she's just the Riley? Worst. That's Riley. Yeah. Yeah, she's not very. Really, I didn't like her. These older than their years cocky kids that talk in sass and sarcasm, they're very annoying. It feels like young person acting, and I just don't give a shit about their relationship. <laughs> the look on Storm Reed's face when Ellie's being impatient, that like, come on now, wait, come on, I've planned this out for you. I just wanted to fucking smack it off her face. <laughs> um, I think there's an anxiety about writing kids to be too kiddy. Mm. 
and there's a sense that there's an element of subversiveness to kids swearing mm. and smart mouthing and outwitting the adults. But at this point, I would say that that's more the rule than the exception in entertainment. Yeah, I wouldn't even say subversive. I think it's just, it feels more akin to how it kind of is. That's the sense, but I yeah. don't think that's an accurate sense. No, not not like, well, the way kids act around each other. Yeah. I think it's closer to that. Like Like with Stranger Things, for example, that felt like they wanted to write kids the way they interact with other kids rather than the way they act with other ad- adults. But I don't think they get it right. I think... I'm not saying they, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. get it right. I'm yeah, saying that's that, what I'm saying that I think that's the goal. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. an adult going, right, how did I talk to other kids when I was a kid? Yes, and you forget. Yeah. And if Juno didn't set the trend of, you know, that smart-mouthing teenager thing, yeah. it was instrumental in, in its pr- proliferation. But that film was particularly heightened, rapid-fire dialogue, and it worked tonally for what that film was. Mm. I don't think teenagers are all dumb and they can't be witty or clever. We were teenagers. I like to think we weren't complete idiots. Yeah. But it's like writers try so hard to avoid writing them as children that they overdo it in the opposite direction. I didn't love eighth grade, the film, Mm. but he nailed that. How teenagers talk. Yeah, I feel like he did. He Uh, nailed it. He got it. He remembers what it was like. And I feel like he interviewed Mm. teenagers, stuff like that. And yeah, adult. You do. I I wouldn't know how to write a kid. No. I write kids like I've seen kids being written in films. Yeah. Yeah. So this episode, it's not enough to write off the show, but it was a massive mess. Yes. A massive mess. A shame that it came so late as well. Yeah, the show's I know. Run. I know. So episodes eight and nine. Mm. Scott Shepard is very good. Is that the main? Yes. Kind of, yes. Yes. The leader of the cult. Yeah. Essentially. On the rewatch. So I really liked episode eight when I first saw it. Mm. And it's not as strong as it initially was. It's probably the third best episode for me. Okay. But I think it's because it came on the hot on the heels of episode seven. Yeah. Like, ah, breath of fresh air. (laughs) It's still one of the better episodes. It's a bit darker, a bit more ruthless. Mm. But this is the point I alluded to earlier. At the conclusion, after she's killed the guy, and Joel's comforting her and calling her baby girl, it didn't really land with me. Okay. And I know there's no exact science to this. I don't know if they need to wait longer, whether it just doesn't click 100% for me because of her, but it felt like their closeness had been accelerated and it didn't fully sit right. The problem is, from one episode to the next, it says like two months later. Mm. And within that, there's an implied um, relationship. Yeah. But I need to see it. Yeah, By yeah. the point where he's like... Because he's so indifferent to her for most of the... At first, he just hates her. Yes. Then it's like, you're just a package. Mm. Then he's just, like, grumpy. Mm. And then, like, he, he laughs once or twice at the jokes. And then slowly, he's like, oh, I guess you're not terrible. And it kind of goes from that to baby girl, baby girl. Yeah. And that was too much of a leap for me. I needed a bit more between. Uh, yeah. I mean, at the same time... I know the circumstances are so horrific. He's like... It activates the dad in him. Yeah, because but... it's not just the, the the severity of the circumstances, but it's like he finally... It's the same with the last episode as well. It's like he finally got to save his daughter, isn't it? Kind of. <sighs> but he doesn't, though, in this one. That's the thing. She saves herself. Yeah, yeah, he, he just finds her. Yeah, look, okay, the yeah, last yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah, the last one, if they'd done a bit more work, I, I, I could have run with that. But, like, he's, he's the character's at a point now where he would do what he does in the final episode. Yeah. But it, it was the baby girl that's so intimate. Mm. And again, I know that... But he doesn't even know what's happened. It, all these sees are running out of a burning building. Yeah. It's like, baby girl... I, I don't know. In the game when it happened, I remember it feeling fine. Mm. And it didn't in the show. Yeah. That's the thing. But they, I, they skipped three months on one episode. That's cheating. <laughs> but yeah, but with... Um, I mean, with the game... Because, like, what would this be? If it was episode eight, this is what? The... Just coming up on the eighth hour that we've spent with these characters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the game, while not having experienced much more in terms of story Mm -hmm. and character development, I think that's, like, the 20th hour you're spending with those characters. You're also dying and having to replay a lot. Yes. So you're spending even more time with the Yeah, you could have spent weeks with Joel and Ellie at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's just a limitation of the form that they've adapted it to. There's also... um, there's something to be said for an unconscious, passive development of the relationship. When you're just walking around in areas, doing your own thing, mm. but you're still talking to it in the background. Yeah. It, it's like it bleeds in more deeply. Yeah. 
uh, rather than like focusing on the character doing this, this emotional beat. I know it's counterintuitive, but I think there's something to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think if you sat and like fucking listened to a podcast, it wouldn't be as good as just having it on. Yeah. You know, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. The finale is a disappointment. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It was a big disappointment. I wish I, at that point, I wish I knew nothing about the game. Okay. Because it, it is the game. It yeah. is just hands up, straight down. No, hands down, straight up, the game. <laughs> um, and I've you know, tried to avoid making comparisons as much as I can. And again, I don't care about the faithfulness. You can't help but stack the two up against each other in your mind, to some degree. But when the plot follows the game to the letter, mm. you're waiting for the surprise that never comes. Because I'd seen episode three and because of the pre-title things on episode seven, as t- horrible as it was, I was waiting for, okay, so how is it going to end differently then? Mm. What additional thing do I get that I didn't get from the game? And I didn't get anything. Okay. The CGI giraffe was a bit shit. <laughs> no, that, that's a real giraffe. No, it's not. That's a real giraffe. Dude, it's not a real no, giraffe. No, I've seen the... It's a real giraffe. It's not a real giraffe. It's a real giraffe. We're going to look at it after this. No, you, and wait, you will no, see it's not a real giraffe. Genuinely, I'm telling you, it's a real giraffe. No, it's not. No, no, it's I'm not. Sad. I'm not, not lying to you. It's, it's not a real, real giraffe. They're feeding a real giraffe. They're feeding a real giraffe. You have to show me because I do. It, yeah, it looks like a CGI giraffe. It looks no, like it's out of the game. I, I don't know if the environment behind it is green screen. It might be. Yeah. Okay. Because there's there is a lot of that, and like, I don't think that the the green screening and the CGI is ever bad in the show. No, it's not. The it's effects not. are usually pretty good, but yeah. you can usually tell when they're against the green screen. Yes, you can. And I don't know what whether that's just that's just the reality that we live in now, where if you're trained to a certain degree well, in that's the it. language of film, yeah. you're just going to see a green screen. If you're trained to a certain degree. I mean, like, there were moments in the second episode, the big money shot, where you see the full, like, the building having collapsed onto the other building. Yeah. I knew, like, oh, you just do a bit of set dressing in this little area where they are, yeah. and then the rest is green screen. Yeah. Yes, if you're trained to a certain degree, you know that. Yeah. So it's but, it's very possible that behind the giraffe, okay. that's all fake. That's, but it, it is a real giraffe. I'll they tell you they what, had a whole, like, okay, like a behind the scenes vignette it. on it. Yeah. i got to be honest, that's really interesting because the, the quality of the CGI giraffe, as I saw it, yeah. was a big turn off. Oh, right. So I thought okay. that really is not good. Okay. And you'll tell me it's a real giraffe. It's a real giraffe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, because Be- yeah, I think they had an interview with Bella Ramsey where it was like, so what was it like feeding a real giraffe? Yeah. And then the, and she was like, oh my God, you know. So I've already spoken about that I think there's a level of, a level of presumption that we're going to have a fondness for these characters. Mm. Joel is low-key and taciturn and I like him. They really want us to heart Ellie and it's not happening for me. As much as they try to endear her to us, no. Mm. I thought the somber tone of Joel's massacre was well judged. Yeah, that was interesting that, that it was played kind of... As a tragedy. Yeah. That he's like forsaken his humanity to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was really good. It's not a cool action set piece. No. And I read... They, so they kept the editing of the game for the climax, beat for beat, mm. uh, because they thought it was re- it worked really well. It was really effective. I actually think it's robbed of something. And the question you have to ask is... Well, that they have to ask is... Would they have done that if not from loyalty to the game? If you were, you've got everything from scratch mm. and you end up at that point, do you edit it that way? And I say almost certainly not. Mm. Right? Yeah. That's a very specific type of editing. Joel making that decision to kill Marlene. Think about this in real time, okay? Yeah, I am. He makes the decision to, call her, uh, to kill her. The lingering silence afterwards. Carrying Ellie away. Driving in silence. Stewing. Mm. Then Ellie wakes up. That's much more potent than the Diddy Killer. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's weird. Yeah. Even the game, it's weird actually. But and the ending is not powerful. I think that's partly because of her. Mm. The okay, which is meant to be this. Oh my god, it says so much. Yeah, it doesn't. To me, it didn't. Mm. No, I, I, I think the this the sudden cut to black after she says okay carries more weight than her performance does. Yeah, well, it's meant to be a really profound emotional moment. Yeah. I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think it was. Mm. In many ways, I think the game is weaker than the show. Mm. I don't want to compare and contrast everything, but just for a couple of examples, Tess's death, much better in the show. Yeah. Joel killing the guard at the end of the pilot, great little yeah. insight in, into how you could like deepen that. It's using what it has, and mm. it's making it better. It's a good show. It's not a great one. And I don't think it can become one, but it's good. 
It's better than most things on TV. Yeah. But it's not a great show. Well, it's the, it's certainly the new gold standard for adaptation. Right? Yeah, it's probably the best video game adaptation ever. I, I would say that it's probably the first decisively, like, objectively good one. Yes. Right? I don't think anyone would say this is... They would, people would say probably they don't like it. Yeah. But I don't think anyone could say, it's oh, it's objectively bad. No. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I am interested to see what effect that has going forward. Because, like, we know that... God of War is now being adapted. Right. Ghost of Tsushima is being adapted as well. And they're games that are kind of reminiscent of The Last of Us anyway. Yeah, in the wake of it. Yeah, so I imagine they're kind of... The way those shows will be adapted and presented Mm -hmm. is going to be very similar to The Last of Us. Yeah. God of War will be interesting just because of the the scale of it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious to see whether they'll go with... Whether they will seek out deliberately cinematic fare... Well, that's the thing. Or whether they will kind of still try to make things like Rampage and Super Mario and Sonic and stuff like that. For all its dues, and it, it, it's g- really good in a lot of ways, um, I don't want to take anything away from it, it's the easiest thing that you get. You can make a good adaptation of. Yeah. Because it's a very linear, very stripped back, not much going on story. Yeah. But there's nothing there that you can expand upon for a television series. Whereas something like GTA or Red Dead, even though people say like, oh, there's a lot of story, it's easy to adapt. It's not, because you've got a whittle and... So much that will have to be lost. Yeah, streamline. Like, what is it actually about and what characters do we use? You have to expand upon the last of us. Even a TV show. Yeah. There's so much you'd have to lose from Red Dead 1. Like, do you even keep Mexico if you're doing Red Dead 1? Right, there's so much stuff like, what, you have to isolate one of the key components. Yeah. Am I adding anything? Do I have to add anything? Yeah. If I'm not adding anything, am I cheating? You know? Yeah. Whereas Last of Us, because it's so basic Mm. and so cinematic... It's really easy. Yeah. So yes, it is the best, but I don't think out of much labour because it was easily the no, easily could be the but best. also I wouldn't. But I I'm not taking anything. Yeah, away from I don't take anything. But it's from still Break a good Mason show. Episode three is still episode three. It's yeah. still a really good show. But that's like you know, the key perspective, I suppose. <laughs> okay. So the end of this season is the end of the first game. Yes. Before there were any plans for a sequel, this was the end of yes. the Last of Us. Yeah. Does it feel like an ending? Um, no, oh, I I don't have an answer for you really. That's it's difficult, right? Because I don't know what the ending is. I know in post-apocalyptic things, it's never going to be they find the thing that saves the world. Yeah, it, it never is that. But that makes me realize I don't really know what the story is, what the yeah. point is. Where does this all lead? Because if they are very faithful to the games, I know where it leads. In which case, nowhere. Yeah. Like, is this really about where it's a father and a daughter becoming a father and a daughter to each other? Yeah. And, like, fuck everything else. It's about them finding happiness, living long. But I know that's not what it's about. Mm. So where does this all lead? I guess that's it, right? Like, it's it's her deciding whether she believes it, whether she actually believes him or not. Yeah. She's decided to. So she's decided to... That's the character beat. ...invest in this father-daughter dynamic that they've kind of created for themselves yeah but so that reminds me of inception right that like everyone said oh is it real or is it not yeah and nolan will always say the point is he doesn't care at that point yeah but that works because the whole film he's checking whether it's a dream or not and when he actually sees his kids he's like fuck it yeah there's nothing about this ending that suggests anything about her growth mm. that she's like She's always been very, no, I want to know what the truth is. And, but, and now she's willing to maybe accept a lie because lies are sometimes better than the truth, as Alfred Pennyworth would tell I mean, us. Yeah, no, but I think, I feel like she's always the first to reject... Bullshit. Yeah. But do, do you and think cynicism that... and like, oh, we can't save them. No, we must try. And now she's finally reached the point where she's like, ignorance is the best thing here. But do you think that really says, is that central to what that story is about? I don't think it is. It's not like the, the, the main theme is... I mean, it, Do you, it, do, it, do you d- d- delude yourself? Do you lie to yourself? Yeah, you... well, it brings her more in line with Joel, I suppose. It's like, about, yeah. like, those two have now... There's now something that they have in common beyond their relationship that they share. But not to jump ahead, doesn't the truth actually make her stop talking to him? I'm to- Well, I'm talking specifically about this now, yeah, this story. Is it that she's choosing to believe him? As in... Oh, I know it's bullshit. Yeah. But we'll have an agreed upon lie. 
or does she she believes in because of the relationship they've developed? Are you asking me what I think? Or I'm asking you what you think, or you, what the intention was? Well, no, because I think the intention was we don't we're not supposed to know, and that is the discussion. Okay, that, that is the the debate that is had once the show is over. Is did she actually believe him or not? Because if the second game is followed, which it will be probably, yeah, and they do the same thing, it can only be that she actually believes him. So it's more about the the depth of the relationship they've developed. Where yeah. like. I'll just take your word for it then, yeah. because you're my protector. It can't be that she chooses to believe it. It's that she actually believes it. Unless that's Craig Mazin's one contribution. That, well, that he changes that. Yeah, it's like, yeah. no, she didn't believe him, and we're going to see how that affects. Maybe. Before Maybe. you decide to brutally murder him, Neil yes. Druckmann. Well, that was, that's it. That's The Last of Us. That's, yeah. that's all I got. Okay, so, Yay. I mean, overall, it's, overall, it's a good thing. I, yeah. I just think you know, th- there's a lot to say against it as well. It's it's a weird kind of mix I've got, mm. which is I think it's better than most shows. But when people talk about how good it is, I kind of want to caveat it with, "Well, hang on, okay." You know what I mean? It's that weird, like, yeah, it's good, but fuck it, like, it's not, it's not a star television. It's like B plus or A television. Okay. And yeah. she's a part of the. She's the biggest reason. Yeah, why. part of the problem. Yeah. That's good, right? Having television worth talking about. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's a good thing that it's in the world. Yeah. I wouldn't want it. Yeah, I like it. Okay, I like it. I just don't love it. Okay. Um, are you going to show me a giraffe? Is that what you're going to do right now? Uh, well, yeah, I was sort of get, uh, sort of getting the, an article up ready. Okay. Um, and yeah, there's one here. Well, yes, the, yeah, well, yes, that's- the giraffe is real, and his name is. Nabo and he lives in Calgary. Because um, I was, I realised that I was being very like firm about it. Yeah, yeah. And I knew I was right. Okay, but, but because I was being so firm you about it, I was like, yourself. Well, no, I'm just gonna be proven wrong now. Did you think it was a real draft when you first watched it? Be honest. I didn't know. You didn't know. Okay. I didn't know. I, I suspected it wasn't. Yeah. But I think that was just because. Well, they're not going to get a real giraffe, are they? Well, I was saying I didn't know. I didn't know. The other giraffes are definitely CGI. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So the beginning of this article is like, some people thought the CGI. It does look was dodgy. Yeah, I don't believe them. I don't believe it's it. It's joyful moment, friendly. Blah 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 blah. Bella Ramsey talking about how amazing it was. Uh, Craig Mazin talking about how amazing it was. And then it just stops loading. That's really annoying. <laughs> We're gonna look this up. That's the game. He might be comped in. Huh? He might be comped in. Or like I said, there's, oh, a, there's, there's a green yeah, yeah, screen, yeah. which is maybe why it doesn't look 100% real. Yeah, fine. Just to kind of extra quiet. Well, I try and divorce the scenery from it. Okay. Just look at the giraffe itself. The way it moves even, it looks... Mm. Do you know what I mean? No, it's, the muscles are too... Um, like, there's too much detail in the way the muscles are moving. Do not get... And the, and the tongue as well. That's not a fake tongue. There's something wrong about it, George. Maybe, I'm, it I'm, not, must, I'm not disputing yeah, that. Yeah, it must be keyed in then. That is not there with them doing that. I'm telling you that right now. It's not eating the thing from her hand. Where's she going? Come on, come on, come on. To the acting bay. Well, there's certainly some VFX in the scene. Elements of the stage featuring CGI, such as the blue screen background. Yeah. The team used real giraffes from the Calgary Zoo. Mm-hmm. And they've oh they go they've even got behind the scenes. Yeah, I want to see behind the scenes footage. Of I'm, I'm loading it up yeah. now. It's not footage; they're stills. I I want to see footage. No, no, the stills are like with the blue screen and everything. Right. Mm. So that ev- that's ev- not that, that that's whole... not compel- I know. I need f- I need a camcorder. Yeah, the whole scene, everything except them and the giraffe is fake, but the giraffe yeah. is real. That doesn't look real. Do you know, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Um, it's a giraffe, mate. <laughs> you can't deny that's a giraffe. It's got blue it's reflection on him and anything. He's clearly there. Yeah. But what I really want is, like, camcorder footage on the ground. Yeah. Like, behind the giraffe as they're up on the thing feed. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's, what, that's I, what... Yeah, but I don't know if... No, no, but that's what I need. Don't give me stills. <laughs> stills are doctored. No, that giraffe was clearly there. No, okay, fine. I will accept it, but... Right, and for a show like this, right, behind the scenes, they film fucking everything, yeah. right, right? If there's no... Oh, it's, it's a conspiracy no, 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 now, no, no. I'm not it? saying it's conspiracy, but you will, you must admit, there must be a fucking trove of footage of that giraffe behind, 
with that trough behind the scenes. I don't know. Look, they probably there were probably rules as to like right, you can't put a camera under the giraffe. No, from from a distance, I'm talking like fucking Cloverfield style, like with a giraffe way over there. I mean, this was a production that was probably they, everyone had to sign NDAs. They couldn't, you couldn't film. Yeah, but no, for the DVD. I'm talking about like actually I'm not talking about like some set, set designer getting a cheeky thing on his iPhone yeah I'm talking about like professionally filmed behind the scene feature ads well maybe we'll wait for the DVD to come out okay? yeah maybe there will until be until then I will not drop it okay <laughs> I, I won't bang on about it's it it's a real giraffe mate it's a real giraffe I won't bang on about it but I need that footage and I will happily I'll happily say now that it's even real... though it has been proven to you that the only real it has things been in that shot were Joel Elliot that's not, the that's not proof. Um, fucking behind the scenes pictures. That's not proof. Are you accept that as proof, do you? Yeah. A man who thinks, well, what do you think about the moon? Well, that it's getting bigger. Yeah, right. So You can't prove me wrong. Well, you can't prove me wrong. Doctored images, AI. Yeah, we could say that about footage as well. You say that about anything. That's the yeah. point. Yeah. So where's your line? But, but well, my line is when I see the behind the scenes featurette okay. showing the actual giraffe. Even though you've and seen like, a couple. No, no, no. Footage. I want footage of the giraffe that's not in the show. Because there is that exists. You don't just go, all right, roll, and then that's all there is of the giraffe. There's going to be fucking loads of it. There's going to be a, a featurette about its transportation, how they chose it, its personality. Well Everything. Considering that this was all done during COVID, that might not necessarily be the case. They, they pulled were, off the show itself. They're going to have... Yeah, but they the were probably limited featurette. in the resources they had access to. Plus, like I said, there's probably rules about... So, film, hang on. Hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. hang on. I'm already saying I'm willing to accept that it's real. Yeah. And if I see that, it will, it will prove it. Mm. Right? Like, conclusively. Mm. I'm not saying that's not proof, the pictures or whatever, but conclusive proof that will shut me up forever about it. Right. Okay? You're already defending the absence of footage that's going to exist. When I think we both know there would be a lot of footage for us. No, not on. necessarily. Do you it? yourself know how anorexic DVD special features are nowadays? Yes, but they put them online instead. Yes, and you've seen, what, two, No, I've seen an videos? HBO Max video with a still that you've already shown me. Nah, you're just being... <laughs> all I'm saying is, there's got to be something additional. You tell me that is all we're ever going to have. Or whatever. No, no, more might well come out. Yes. I guess what And I'm more saying. does exist, crucially. Maybe. There is more footage of that giraffe than the 20 seconds it's on screen. Yeah, but that's stuff that we would never see anyway. They're not going to release unfinished rushes like I'm that. not talking about takes that weren't used or anything like that. I'm just talking about like around the set. Look, when it comes to the everything's filmed. They mm. film everything on these sets, mm. behind the scenes stuff. Especially with a big thing like this, which is going to have a lot of interest. But like I said, it's worth it. remembering that this was done during COVID. I'm aware. Where I'm aware. They were done. limited in what they. I'm aware how many people they could have. But we've already seen some behind the scenes pictures of them wearing masks. Mm. So it would just be everyone wearing masks. Look, it's a real <laughs> giraffe, Sam. No, you just have to accept. No, no, no. That. And I'm not saying it's not at this point. You're just saying that. Listen, I you don't believe that it's real, listen, even though you. Listen, listen. When you told me that it's actually a real giraffe. I believed you instantly. I'm ready to believe- You're not behaving like someone who believes instantly. I'm ready to believe that it's a real giraffe, but I maintain something's wrong. It looks ropey. It doesn't look like a real giraffe. And all I need to concretize my, look, I'm leaning towards it's a real giraffe. I'm, hev <laughs> I'm, heavily, I'm heavily leaning- I don't, I don't think you are, I'm mate. heavily leaning towards it. The argument stems from, I just, there is extra footage of that giraffe. And I want to see it. The ultimate point, in terms of critical review, is that whether it's real or not, it doesn't look real. So whatever they've done is not effective. No, and what they've done, what it looks like they've yeah. done, based on what we've been given in yeah. terms of the stills and it, what it looks like they've done is they've put Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey mm -hmm. on a blue screen yes. with a giraffe, and the entire environment that they inhabit yeah. is fake. Yes. But that's not the bit that... I know you're saying, because it's the contrast. Yeah. But I'm just looking at the giraffe, and, like, it doesn't look real to me. No, and so what, it yeah. could be badly composited. Yeah. Because it's it's both kind of inside and outside the building. So, in a way, they're kind of matching... They're trying to match two so, different environments of lighting. Okay, so that you have the giraffe itself, right? Yeah. And it's moving. Even though they're in the same shot, they probably separated those in yeah, elements yeah, yeah, yeah. during compositing. So the giraffe will exist on its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like... The, the bit that that is 
the actual cutout of the giraffe, yeah. if you know what I mean. Mm. That's the problem with how it's engaging with. Yeah, well, the other thing as well that I noticed with the behind the scenes photos. Yeah. Is that you can see the blue from the blue screen reflecting on the giraffe's skin. Mm. So they would have had to have recolored the giraffe. And it's possible that it, it doesn't match the environment right. correctly. That's probably it then. Yeah, it could be bad compositing, but it is a real giraffe. Bad compo- yeah. Bad com- a real giraffe that they had to do so much work on yeah. that it's ended up not looking real. Yeah. Because um, I think if you do pay attention to like when it's eating, like it's t- when its tongue comes yeah, out yeah. in particular, but when it's like chewing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's too much... You think it's too well done. Yeah. If it was... Yeah. Yeah. What, like, you can you can just tell with, like, micro-muscle movement like that with CG. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's not necessarily bad. It just... It never... The movement is just never right. And that, that looked right to me. Okay. Because I tell you my problem with it, because you were saying, like, oh, it might just be bad compositing and that. Yeah. I was just looking at the actual head of the giraffe. Yeah. And that didn't look right to me. Mm. But if they've overlaid something, like, because of the blue reflection... Yeah. That's what it is. In yeah, which case, be. it essentially becomes a CG giraffe. Yeah, okay. Do you know I, what I mean? Yeah, when, yeah, it, yeah, when yeah. there's enough digital masking to it, yeah, it becomes, is it still a real... Yeah, yeah. I, I okay, say. okay, fine. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. That's it then. Okay. That's proven. That's certain. That's a certainty for me now. Right. I don't need to see the footage. Okay. Because I knew something was... Like that, as a giraffe's head, wasn't a natural giraffe's head. Okay. And that was saying that something has been... It has been augmented. Yeah. Right. You happy? So, I'm ha- well, never happy. Okay. But I'm content. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's do the Super Mario Brothers movie. Do you know they actually used a real gorilla for uh, oh, for Donkey oh, Kong in this? Well, they didn't re- use a real Italian American. <laughs> no, they didn't. Certain. They did not. Uh, well, the opening scene is the second best thing in the film. Uh, it's pretty much all downhill from there. Uh, the opening I, scene being the teaser trailer. I was right. Yeah. It yeah, was, yeah. Um, this is definitely a pattern with illumination. They take yeah. the opening scene and that's your teaser. And like like I said at the time, I don't know whether it was a sign that illumination, it became a great trailer on accident. Right. Because it, like you look at that and you go, oh, they're just showing me the film. Mm-hmm. That projects confidence yeah but in reality they're not even editing their trailers they're just lifting the t- the front of the film off the timeline and just plopping it into the trailer yeah although there is edit like the editing in the film is worse than the trailer it is the trailer's better than it yeah um but what it does even if you're like vaguely trained like i wouldn't have known that's what illumination does but if you're used to trailers mm you know that they don't just put a scene in a trailer. That's yeah. not what films do. Yeah. So you watch it and you think, oh, they've really put effort into the marketing. Yeah. They've done something that isn't going to be in the film, but it is, and yeah. it's not even as good. Yeah. So that's a bit shit. Yeah. Now that it's here, yes. But like yeah. at the time, I mean, it did its job. That's oh, a good trailer. Yeah, because we talked about it. Yeah, yeah. We never talk about trailers. It's a good trailer. Yeah. But it's not a good film. Let's just skip to that. Oh, all right. Okay. It's not a good film. Okay. Uh, the Italian accent fake out in the beginning is dumb and it's a cheat to get out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, them being Italian American might have been sufficient, but they weren't even enough of that. No. Charles Martinet, I think his name is. Right. The voice actor for Mario in the okay. games. Uh, he's a Frenchman, but yes. he does the voice of Mario, does the voice of Luigi, Wario, uh, Waluigi, basically any like okay. male human character. Mm-hmm. Does he do Bowser? No, he doesn't do Bowser. Okay. Does he? Uh, no, I don't think he does Bowser. Uh, and I don't know if he does Toad. But, like, the main Mario... Yeah, he, okay. he does them. Mm-hmm. Um, he's in this film. He plays Mario's father, I who, see. who is very Italian-American. Yes. Because he's like, hey, Dad, what do you think of our business? And he's like, hey, you're a fucking disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go fuck you're yourself, fa- Mario. You're a fan. <laughs> yeah. Ah, thanks, Dad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he does that, and there's like another character in that family unit that he plays as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he does a very good Italian American. Well, thing, th- th- but the actual voice actors don't. I think they thought, oh, we'll get away with it for like the family because they're not in it that much, and we can be full on with them, mm. so we won't get like probably won't get accused of yeah. stereotyping. And also, I think the misplaced thought that if they're like this they're not going to be bland enough to, for us to relate to. They're not going to be, um, 
universal enough. Yeah. If they're too specific. Yeah. They need to be a bit... The edge is sanded off, you know? Yeah. And that ru- ruined it. They should have been... Hey, fuck. If, if they weren't Italian, then they should have been like... Hey, Louis, I gotta find my brother. Yeah. My brother. Is what <laughs> my brother. Yeah, I gotta yeah. find my brother. Hey, princess. Hey, pri- hey, hey Peaches. <laughs> hey, Where's my peaches? brother? Hey, bring those Peaches over here. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what it should hey, be. Hey, yo, who's this big turtle, man? Hey, yo, what are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. Yeah. Uh, I'd that watch that. Been, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I would watch the exact same film. But if it was with that voice. <laughs> with that voice, yeah. yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, they've got that platform-style obstacle course. Yeah. Um, oh, the po- the thing that was quickly rounding, uh, yeah. round up the point with Charles uh, Martinet. Martin. Yeah, actual voice actor for Mario, but he's not playing Mario yeah. in the Mario film. Bugs me. <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine. Okay. Because they do it a lot. They did it in The Last of Us, but it, like, it was kind of okay. I get why they did it. it, it for the same reason. Well, I mean, Troy Baker is too wiry to play Joel in real life. And I don't think so. I th- yeah, we're, we're seeing how, like... Now that I've seen Pedro Pascal as a, li- a live-action Yes, Joel, but Joel could have been that. I guess he could have, but I feel like Pedro inhabits... In live-action, he was the better choice, I think, for Joel. For how he is in the game. For yeah. how he is in the yeah, game. Yeah. And obviously, uh, Ashley Johnson can't play Ellie because she's, yeah, she's far too bit, old. A bit too old, yeah. Um, and it's nice Even though when she was in it, it was like, oh, it's a shame. Because I thought she was okay in the show. Yeah, she was, yeah. 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 They, no, they were both good. Yeah. They both, like, it's nice knowing that, like, they're voice actors, but they're also good actors. Yeah, and the brother as well. And the, yeah. yeah, and they were given the opportunity to actually act as well. It's like, you're not yeah. just a cameo. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, you are going to be an important side character in this story, and actually you're going to play oh, yeah. an important Joel role Oh, yeah, Joel gets in... fucking meat cleavered by Ellie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's nice. But generally speaking, it is a pet peeve of mine. Because, like, what... You've got the... Mario's right there. It's only not... Why pe- is he not... Well, it's not a pet peeve because I'm not a gamer. Yeah. It's not... I mean, you know, adaptations in general. I know gaming is, like, yeah, the main yeah, yeah. one, but, like... It's, it's it only happen. because I know, realistically, they want names. Yeah. So it's never going to be the game people, with the exception of Sonic, for some reason. But it's weird because, like... Yeah, that's bizarre. Yeah. But, like, when they did a Ratchet & Clank film... Yeah. They kept... The voice actors for Ratchet and Clank mm. and Korg, like one of the main comic right. side characters, and everyone else was a uh, was a celebrity, a known celebrity. Okay, so they did kind of right. We'll surround the. But what was the budget for Ratchet and Clank? I I don't know. It wasn't like a major film, was it? It was a weird one because they they did the feature film and then they released the tie-in video game, and a <laughs> lot of the cutscene, which is bizarre, yeah. you know. But all of pretty much all of the tie-in cutscenes in the game mm. were just clips from the film. Right. Yeah. So it was almost like the film was just the game, but like all the cutscenes were put together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't know what the overall budget was, and it tanked. Did not do very well. Yeah. But like Sylvester Stallone was in it and Paul Giamatti was in it and right, they had all these right, big known right. names. And then it's just the ratchet voice actor. Okay. The Clank voice actor. And in fairness, I think they were even, like, on the poster as well. It wasn't just Sylvester Stallone and... Okay. Well, I mean, um, that's a way of doing it. I suppose that's a bit harder to do. I mean, I don't know how rat- what the Ratchet and Clank universe is. Mm. It's a bit harder with Mario, because there's not, like, a, a wide... No. ...surrounding voice cast. Well, yeah, um, I mean, like, pretty much all of the characters, they have... They have vocalizations. They don't have voices. Yeah, Peach I mean, speaks a little bit in the games, but like Bowser is completely mute. Yeah, I mean in the film, there's like oh, he's completely mute in the games. Yeah, he's there's just, like just five drums. characters, or five or six, really. Yeah. So that I don't, you couldn't have really got away with it. I don't think as easily. Yeah, but no, I get why it would be annoying. But at the same time, you know they're gonna want a Chris Pratt or a Chris Pine or Chris Evans or Chris yeah. whoever. Um, Hemsworth. That's the other one. <laughs> Yeah, so you got that platform style obstacle course in the beginning, mm. which is is what you'd expect. Right? Like I knew that was coming. Oh, you mean when they're running through Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To no sleep from uh, till Brooklyn. Oh, was it okay? Yeah. Um, like, oh yeah. Can I just say the like the needle ugh, music drops? choices? Yeah, it, that's a point I've got. Is it worse than Suicide Squad? Yeah, it's one of the worst I've seen. Yeah, because it's so obvious, and it's it's what other films have already done. It's um, it's so obvious, but like at the same time, you have moments like when Take on Me plays while they're in the car. That was inexplicable. I think that's only because it's eighties, okay, and it's vaguely related in that like isn't that when they first link up him and Peach? No, no. Who's no. who's in the? When is that scene? It's when they it's when they turn up at the Donkey Kong Kingdom and the 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 blonde gorilla takes them to see the king. 
He's just driving them through the, the jungle. Take on me. Literally, it's 80s then. That's all. It's yeah, because it's, it, it's not even like a like a, a driving song, is it? No, not really. Like a famous driving song. No. It's just that, no, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, Thunderstruck for the car yeah. race. I need a hero. I need a hero with doing track two. You know, it's I like... No, I think I literally saw a tweet where someone was saying, like, I know that, like, you know, the, this and The Last of Us, they're both interesting case studies. There yeah. it is again. Right. For, like, how you go about doing an adaptation. Mm. But I think I saw a tweet where someone said they had, between Donkey Kong and Super Mario, they had over 40 years of music to kind of choose from when they were scoring right. this film. Right. And the best they could come up with was stealing from the Shrek 2 soundtrack. Yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. that's what they decided to go with. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, uh, yeah, the music is terrible. But as in, like, that obstacle course thing, I knew they would do that before he's in the Magic Mushroom Kingdom. And if it was just that, yeah. I would have been completely fine with it. And I would have been fine with it. It's effective at establishing a natural ability. Yes. But then it doesn't follow through on that. And that's what's really strange. <laughs> that's the problem. Because when he, like, hooks up with Peach, in the sense, like, he meets her in the castle. <laughs> yeah, they don't fuck. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Um, and she's like, all right, you need to prove your worth. And she puts forward, like, this obstacle course, and she's like, if you complete this, you can come on this quest with me. And, of course, you and I, both being people trained in the language of cinema, we go, right, well, we've just seen Mario Mm. being very capably athletic when he was navigating that building site. So he's going to do this. Mm. He's going to prove himself. Mm. But he doesn't. No. He's fucking shit. <laughs> and they do, the, they do the fake out. Yeah. But they do it three or four times. Yeah. Which was really annoying. It would Yeah, been... I don't know why they bothered. No, if they were going to do that, if they just yeah. wanted a moment where it's like, oh, they have to literally do a Super Mario level, mm. wouldn't it have made more sense? Because Luigi's in the, in the first one. Yeah. Like, what, the obstacle course, and he's bad at it. Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah. Mario is having to keep putting things down so that... It's like, a, it's like you, what you'd have to do in a game, clear the path for someone else. Yeah, and for, like, the little brother. Opens the door to... Literally, yeah, for the yeah. little brother who yeah, yeah. can't play the game very well. Yeah. And so, surely that obstacle course would be Luigi's way of proving his worth. Right. Or what would be interesting is if Mario does the course, Mm -hmm. but Luigi can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so Princess Peach says, I'm sorry, Luigi, you can't come on this quest with us. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get separated. Inferiority, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Luigi goes on his own little side adventure trying to prove himself, ends up getting captured by Bowser, and that's how you bring it in. I wasn't expecting wonders from this film, but there were a couple of moments where I thought, okay, if you'd just done this slightly differently... It would be, like, effective. So, yeah, like, that opening thing, I thought, right, so I get that he's good at navigating obstacles. Yeah. Right, but then they kind of reneged on that. And then um, the dog scene, which is, the, the dog's the best thing in the film. Yeah. But it's a cheat because it's a dog. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, like, a dog that expressive yeah, as yeah. well. That's not fair. Yeah, no, it's not fair. And it's trying to attack them, and they're locked in a bathroom with it. Yeah. And I thought the scene would have been, I thought that's where it was going, a good opportunity to demonstrate how Mario vanquishes his foe by being clever yes or resourceful or using his plumbing knowledge yes they're in a bathroom thought right he's not he doesn't have brawn or might he's gonna outwit them yeah and he kind of does that on accident yeah but then that falls through but then the promise that that establishes in the film is also broken because he only ever achieves anything by power-ups yeah Never by being clever or, like, really learning anything or doing anything that kind of undercuts the... It's he gets a power-up and now he's a squirrel and he's a cat and he's a he's yeah. big and... Because, like, it, halfway through the film, the, they go to the, the Kong kingdom. Yeah, and Kongdom. The Kongdom. And Cranky Kong is like, I'm not giving you my army unless yeah, yeah. you defeat Donkey Kong. Yeah. And, and Mario's like... <laughs> yeah, I fucking called it. Mm. I knew we were going to get the Seth, Ro- yeah, the Seth yeah. Rogen laugh as Donkey Kong. Why? Because why does it need it. to continue happening? Because unless it's Steve Jobs or the Fablemans, you got to have a Seth Rogen laugh. Why? I don't. It's know. It's not even a good laugh. But people like it, and they. Why? I don't know. Why? Sam? I don't know. You're. I don't know. You're asking me. I hate it. <laughs> I. I really don't like Seth Rogen. No. I don't get the Seth Rogen thing. He's fine in those films because he's in a good film. Yeah. But no, I don't get the Seth Rogen thing. No. I really don't get the Seth Rogen. Thing. <laughs> It's like um, Jimbo in The Simpsons. It's that kind of laugh, you know? You know the, the lead bully? Hey, Bart! <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, like the tall skinny one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with a skull shirt. Yeah. 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 So, yes, yeah, carry on. Yeah, Donkey what was Kong. My, what was my point? Oh, yeah, when he was like, yeah, yeah you got you to gotta fight Donkey Kong. And Mario was like, all right, I'll, f- all right, I'll fight. I'm trying to do the boss, then I can't do it. 
It's not British Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah. sorry. I was like, I'll fight you, Donkey Kong, but yeah. I, I literally can't do the accent. <laughs> well, they don't do it, so I don't know why you should. <laughs> well, I thought it would be funnier if it was like... Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, I'll, hey, I'll fight you, Donkey Kong. Come yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. There you go. All right. Thanks. It's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, and Donkey Kong beats the ever-living shit out of him. Yeah, as he would. Yeah. Like, Mario is on the floor. He is bruised. He's not even... He's barely conscious. Mm. He's talking nonsense. <clears throat> and then he becomes a cat. Yes. And, like, he scratches Donkey Kong a couple of times and wins. Yeah. I know Donkey Kong nearly falls off the side, and he, like, falls over. But Mario was, like, in a worse state than Donkey Kong. Yeah. And, honey, he didn't lose? Well, Mario just isn't really a character in this film. I don't know what his... I don't know who he is. I don't know what he has to learn, or what... They they try and put in a thing about, like, he's got to prove himself to his family, kind of thing. But he's just like he's just in places, and then he does a power up, and he's kind yeah. Of- and that was the something that the film that was the film's responsibility to get right because Mario in the games he isn't a character. Yeah, exactly. He's, so you really got a the most yeah. like uh, self insert thing that exists. Well, this would be a good example of like we we've covered the scale tonight in terms of um, video game adaptations. You've got The Last of Us, which is. I would say quite easily adaptable because yeah. there's it's a basic story that then you have but it's a you know it's cinematic and yeah. narrative heavy and character heavy that you then have to add a bit to you've got the middle which is Rockstar which is right okay there's a lot of stuff and there's a good story in there but I need to find it yeah and then you've got Mario which is complete invention yeah. you've got like the iconography and then you have to invent everything else yes so in a way that's kind of not easy, but as um, open a challenge as The Last of Us because it's well, I can do any film I want as long as I use the yeah iconography, I can invent entirely. I can just do whatever film I want to do. Yeah, and they didn't do a it. Yeah, a good it, it thing. didn't feel like, and I don't know how much of this was down to the fact that this was a co-production with Nintendo. Yeah, it feels like they were less interested in doing a Super Mario film. Mm-hmm. And they were more interested in doing, like, a sizzle reel of the Mario franchise. It's just like a, a middle-of-the-road traditional kid adventure movie. Yeah. It's like, here's the Mushroom Kingdom. Here is the song from Bowser's Fury. Here is yeah. the uh, Super Mario level. Here is Mario Kart. Here is Donkey Kong. Here is these characters that you vaguely recognize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that. It's just a collection of stuff, like, loosely thread through... A well, plot that doesn't even stand up correctly. Well, it wanted to be the definitive Mario film. It wanted to be the Lego movie of Mario. Yeah. Just get all the stuff in. Yeah. But it's just stuff. It's just stuff. And there is... There's, that's the thing. There's enough stuff left out that they could do more. And I think I think the post-credit teaser is Yoshi, even. So it's like they've already... It, I thought it was Bowser. Well, there's Bowser, but then Yoshi's... Oh, at there's the very another end. one, right. Yeah, okay. so it's like, all right, so they're definitely planning on like yeah, continuing yeah. this. But yeah, this is not a strong foundation to build a franchise No, on. it's really not. And a lot of things don't make sense. Like, at the very end, we're jumping all over the place here, but they... Well, the, 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 the film, yeah, literally yeah. jumping all yeah. over the place. They accidentally... He accidentally creates a wormhole. Oh, yeah. That sucks them all into the, demen- the Earth dimension. Yeah. And they're back in Brooklyn... And then the thing, like, when he's at his lowest point and he can't defeat Bowser, he sees the advert that he and Luigi made about protecting Brooklyn or whatever. Yeah. And that gives him the strength to... Uh, but then at the very end of the film, they go and live in the Mushroom Kingdom. Yeah. Exactly. This is a problem. So it's kind of like... I, 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 that didn't make any sense to me. Like, them frequenting it, visiting it... Yeah. Makes sense. Like, they daily work things. They go down to the sewer, go through the pipe, and they plumb in Mushroom King. It just didn't make sense. Like, yeah, for Brooklyn, and then ah, oh, fuck it. Yeah, we'll go. We'll go live in fantasy world. They don't even establish the Mushroom Kingdom as a place that needs plumbers, other than there are pipes, but they don't carry water. No, so yeah, they carry <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, magic pipes. Well, let's. We'll get to that point. So, okay, so they stumble across this subterranean nirvana of pipes. Yeah, that wasn't nearly enough of a nirvana because. I don't know what a sewage system really looks like. No. But I can't imagine it's that far from reality as, as was depicted what they in the saw, film. yeah. In a, in a major city like that, it probably would be like a few stories deep. A bit like that, with a lot of pipes. Yeah. But this is supposed to be like, what is this place? It's the gateway to this other kingdom. Mm. And it, it just looks like sewers. And there's one pipe that's coloured a little bit differently from the others. Yeah. And that's what sucks you into... Right, 
my question is not what is going on, but why is going do, on? Does there need <laughs> does there need to be an explanation for the interdimensional pipe? Am I supposed to just like oh it's fantasy that's where it is? I I think I need something. Why is that pipe there? Oh, is this okay? I feel like this is a criticism that could be levied to a lot of the film, really. Yes. I mean. I, again, I don't know what the film expects from you as an audience member, whether it just assumes you understand Mario. So I feel like yeah. it's not an unreasonable request for you to at least know what Super Mario is. Most it, people it, do. In the, it's a game. Yeah. yeah. Most people know what Super Mario is. Yes. Even if it's just they know the name Super Mario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that bigger brand. Right. It's one of the biggest brands in existence. I, yeah. But I don't know how familiar it expects you to be with the iconography of Super Mario. Well, I mean, I know... Do you know that there are pipes that people can just go through? Do you know what a power-up is? Do you know what a question mark block is? Well, I Do think... you know that these platformers will just hover in the air? Well, Because however... none of that gets explained. No, however iconic it is, you still have to assume as the filmmaker that I know nothing about it. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I don't know anything. I don't even know what Mario is. Yeah. Uh, that's what you have to assume. And I know it's fantasy and everything, and yeah, in the game, fine, because because it's a game, mm. and the type of game it is, I don't really need to know why going through a pipe takes me to... No, the... that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shigeru Miyamoto in particular, I think he's come under criticism before, because while he is, like, a genius of his craft, mm -hmm. he's created Mario, he's created Zelda, I think he had a hand in Pokemon, like, all of these, like, right. iconic okay. Nintendo franchises yeah. that dominate the planet. Mm-hmm. He's had a hand in them. Yeah. He's coming to fire because he's not a story guy. That's fine. He works purely with the mechanics yeah, of yeah. what it is. Yeah. Every kind of new Mario game in particular, but kind of like the other major franchises, all the major innovations they make are mechanical. Mm -hmm. Or they, they're an extension of the console that Nintendo makes for them to be played on. Yes. So it's like, oh, these new motion controls or, you know, touchscreen technology and well, they're, or they're like Mario. You know? This this is the new gimmick that Mario can like use in the game. Yes. Yeah. It's never about expanding the universe. No. And in fact, there are like instances where people that were working on the games were pitching him ideas like, oh, this is how we expand the lore. Mm. This is how we explain the presence of Mario in this sequel. Right, right. And he would go, no. Well, I don't think Mario needs that. I don't, in the games, I, I mean, I don't need Mario law. I'm happy with, it's a platformer, he's a plumber. Yeah. It's a, it's an obstacle course. This thing just floats there. Yeah, like, fine, I yeah. don't need that. But in a film, with yeah. 3D reality, yeah. I, I don't think it's asking too much. Like, I don't think I'm being finicky about, like, I don't need an intricate mythology explained to me. Yeah. I just need to, what is the world? It, they never, what is the world they've gone to? It's what the it, Mushroom Kingdom. What is the power-up? Yeah, what is but just what is the world would have done? Like yeah. that would have suited for the time being. Like, oh yeah, by the way, there are loads of galaxies. Um, they, they, in every dimension, there is a portal. It was, you know, and this is the one into yours, and uh, maybe a sense of like who created it and that. Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah, I just need to know it's like another galaxy, another dimension of some kind. Yeah, I can deal with things that levitate because it's another dimension. Whatever magic exists, but you have no sense of where in time and space you are, what it is, yeah. the laws of it, the yeah. law of it, yeah. and just a bit. I needed a bit of it. Mm. And again, that's like on the filmmakers, like you get to invent it. Yeah. You can invent upon that. Um, but it doesn't, it, I don't think it cares. I don't no, think it doesn't cares care. about that. It, it just doesn't goes, care at all. Look, here's Mario. And I think there's going, one line Yeah, in but the film. Ex can you explain it to me? And they go, no, the film's going, no, this yeah. is Mario. Yeah, it's Mario. Deal with it. Yeah. There's one line in the film where someone says there are loads of galaxies and universes. Yeah. But that's like, yeah, that'll do. It's like, no, just like how are they connected? What is <laughs> what is this yeah. place? But even that could just be seen as like, oh, that's foreshadowing like a character that could appear in a sequel. Yeah, yeah. Because there is like a, um, there's a character called Rosalina who's basically like a Princess Peach type figure, mm. but of like a different galaxy. Right, right. So it's like, oh, that could be like a way of opening the universe up so that Rosalina can come into mm -hmm. it. It's not even an explanation of what the fuck is this thing, you know? And again, so like the original Mario, I know we popped up in Donkey, Donkey Kong and everything. Yeah. What's the original Mario game? Super Mario Brothers. It's Super Mario Brothers, right. Yeah. And does that game, I know it's, you know, of its era, so I'm not, it's not going to have cutscenes and anything. No. But does that game just begin with, and you land in, yeah. on a platform. That's it. You don't it, even land, you're just there. You're just there. Is there any, is there any crawl text, like anything that, no. like, there's not, you're just there. It's literally, you complete the level. Yeah. 
and the toad goes, sorry, Mario, the princess is in another castle. And, then, and I, you do more levels. And then that's the first time you go, oh, there's a princess on the castle. Yeah. Right, okay. Now that works perfectly fine in the game. I don't have to have questions about it. Yeah. Now this is a recurring bug bit, and I know it's a difficult one to navigate. In a game where it's a blip that I'm controlling, I don't need to have any, you know, cognitive reality to that character. Yeah. If an Italian-American plumber from Brooklyn landed in a Mushroom Kingdom, mm. they would be a bit more bewildered. <laughs> uh, and it would take quicker to inure them to the environment. Yeah. And this is a recurring issue. It's not unique to this film. Characters that, as far as they're concerned, live in the reality that we do. Yeah. And then they are transported to a mystical land and don't freak out and don't, like... You need more than, like, five minutes to get over yeah. the idea. Yeah, you have his little moment where he's like, ah, oh, there's a little mushroom man talking to me. It's a yeah. mushroom man. And I think that's literally it. Yeah, and the music swells. He's like, right, off to the print. Like, he just deals with it straight yeah. away. And again, I know it's hard. Like, what else he's supposed to do? Have him, like, having a panic attack for an hour. Mm. But, but, like, something in between. Yeah. Where you're like, this isn't real. What the fuck's going on? Am yeah. I, did I take mushrooms? You know, like, what is happening? Something, mm. you know. Yeah, so in 2023, it wasn't feasible that they would have characterized Peach as the damsel in distress. Yeah. They weren't going to do that. And I think it's not a bad idea to make Luigi the one that needs saving. I think that's actually a decent idea. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to give it props. Well, no, where, I'm, where I'm I, like, yeah, I yeah, have my I own point to make, but I'm, I'm allowing you to no, that's kind of it. say what you want. that's kind of it. Like, they end up there, there's a quest. It makes sense that it would be getting Luigi. Okay. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, my point was going to be Princess Peach has historically been the stereotypical damsel in yes. distress. But, like, she's been a playable character in the games for a while now, mm -hmm. and even within the mainline Mario games, which have the traditional Princess Peach gets cap captured plot, okay. like Mario Odyssey, which this takes a little bit from, because I think, you know, uh, Bowser's uh, wedding outfit yeah. is literally taken from Mario Odyssey. It's okay. like, so they do pull that kind of stuff right. in. Um, even in moments like, even in games like that, more modern example, she does have some agency and some character mm -hmm. of her own. So she's never, they have been moving her away from that damsel in distress yes. role for a while. Mm -hmm. But this film is a massive overcorrection. To oh, the, I agree. To the point where Mario is completely useless in the Super Mario film. But I, but I don't think that's... Peach. Yeah. With, with literally no adjustments. Mm. You could take Mario out of this film and Peach would be a perfectly serviceable I, protagonist. I, I agree. I 100% agree. But I don't think it's because they overcorrected on on the continuum of agency. And like, oh, we need to make sure that she's the hero. Yeah. I think that it was just so badly done that Mario ends up being pointless. Yeah. I mean, he does save the day, ultimately, but through kind of accident. Yeah. And through having caused it in the first place. Yeah, I've got here. All he contributes f to the mission is delaying them a day, which yeah. would have given them more time to exactly. stop. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because Peach is like, I'm going to go to the mushroom, I'm going to go to the jungle kingdom now. Yeah. And then she sees Mario, and she's like, oh, right, I'm going to train you yeah. for a whole day. Yeah. But I, so and the whole threat of the finale is they've run out of time. Yeah. But if she hadn't done that, she would have literally, like... Yeah. But I, I think that's... All I'm arguing is that it's a failure of writing. It's poor, rather than, like, active... Let's feminist this bitch up. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just like it wouldn't even occur to them that like if she hadn't trained him, they would have got there on time and he's just like a lead balloon. No, no, exactly. Yeah. But because they've but, um, given yes. her a lot more yes. proficiency. Yeah, yeah. It's so it just so happens that like if Mario had been taken out of that situation, yeah. Peach would have been able to deal with it just fine. It's one of those like raiders situations where the Nazis were digging in the wrong place, why not just let them? Yeah. <laughs> like, if, if he wasn't around yeah. There'd be no film. She would have turned yeah, up yeah. to the Jungle Kingdom early. If she had challenged Bowser, uh, Donkey Kong instead of Mario, mm -hmm. she would have just been taken a power up and won. Because yeah. that's what Mario did. She made it back to the Mushroom Kingdom when no one else did. Yeah. Out on Rainbow Road. Yeah. She single handedly forced off everyone at Bowser's wedding, takes Bowser out of commission, saves all of the people being dipped into the lava. Yeah. I know Donkey Kong's the one that pulls it up. But the only thing that Mario contributes to that is when Luigi falls, he picks him up. Which is like in the moment, it wasn't part of the... No. He happens to be there when that happened. It's yeah. not like it was all leading to this. Exactly. Yeah. And he fucks up by creating that wormhole yeah. that brings everyone into Brooklyn. 
Yeah, he's a loser. Yeah, he literally, <laughs> like, he makes everything worse. worse. Donkey Kong is the one that saves them from the, yeah. the sea monster that, like, it swallows them. Which also would be a funny idea that, like, the, the hero is actually a loser that contributes to something. Yeah. If it wasn't, if that was the intent. Yeah. But it's not like, no, we still have to accept him as the hero, even when he keeps fucking up. But exactly. And not really add <laughs> And the ridiculous thing as well is, I know what you're saying about, like, oh, saving Luigi is fine. And I feel yeah, like yeah. I, I gave a good example earlier of, like, how you can still do yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. by making him fail the obstacle course rather than Mario. Mm -hmm. But I guess, like, the thing is that, like, all throughout this film, Mario is, like, he's learning the ways of the Mushroom Kingdom and he's... I, I, I wasn't. Okay, well, if we're yeah. being charitable, okay. let's say that this whole thing, Mario is training, he is getting better, he yeah. is learning to be a better... Like, he... By the end of the film, he is in a place where he could legitimately take on Bowser. Mm -hmm. Luigi went through none of that training. Mm -hmm. And he's right there with Mario at the end, kicking ass. Yeah, yes. Because of the power-up. Because of the power-up. Because um, this is... That's the thing. This is the Super Mario Brothers movie. So fucking deal with it. Like, they're power-ups. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. but like, this, this is the Super Mario Brothers movie that Luigi is barely in. Yes, and you you said then that this is um, let's be charitable and say that he's learning the ways of the Mushroom Kingdom and he's getting better. What, he's becoming a better what? Right? He's not becoming a better plumber. No. He's not learning to be a better brother. No. That's not like that's the thing. There's no character. He doesn't learn. Yeah, he's always been anything there to cover Luigi's back. Yeah, and when they're in Brooklyn, it's not like he forgets his, where he comes from and then has to be reminded. He's just. He's momentarily defeated. Yeah. And then he sees his own advert, which kind of reminds him... Which, when you see it, you go, oh, fuck off. Yeah. Because it's one of those contrived moments. But that's the problem. I don't really know who the guy is. I don't know what he learned, how he became better. They're, they're tight the whole film. Lu you know? Yeah, Luigi is the one that had somewhere to go. It's, only, it's purely external approval. That the family think he's a bit of a joke. And then when he saves Brooklyn... Yeah. Which, by the way, they get quickly used to the idea that the dimensions of fucking... Yeah, also, how many of them know that this is actually all Mario's fault? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And they go, oh, yeah, you are... But th that's so, like, cynical in a way, because what was supposed to happen in those moments is, like, oh, no, you were always worthy, and now I realise that you always were because of something that's happened now. Yeah. Not like, yeah, you weren't worthy, but now that you've defeated Bowser... Really, is that the stakes? That's a pressure that's on Mario. <laughs> is unless he defeats Bowser, this interdimensional thing, yeah. he would never have matched up in his parents' sight. Surely they should have gone, oh, now we fucking realise you were always like, you know, like, yeah. that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. That's so horrible. That's cynical. <laughs> and like I said, Luigi has a better, like, with much less screen time. Yeah. He overcomes his, like, anxieties. Yeah. And becomes brave and like faces Bowser at the end. Yeah. And he gets the approval of the dog. Yes. So he achieves <laughs> more than Mario yeah. while doing significantly less. Which is the best moment in the film is the dog's like nod of yeah, approval. Yeah, nod of approval. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let's quickly talk about the assault course. Right. Why is it needed? Yeah. Who designed it? Yes. Why is the whole world constructed the way it is? Yeah. What's going on? Yes. See, it's never These are questions I have yeah. to. It's never explained wh why, what the purpose of that assault course is. No. Is it like, oh, if you can do this, you'll kind of like, you can walk in our world. And if so, why is reality like that? It's like it's, like it's a built reality rather than an organic yeah. galaxy. It's like, oh, someone made it so it's all pipes and it's blah, blah, blah. Which is strange because... It's like playing a video game. It's like, here's the introductory level to make sure yeah, you know no, what you're doing. Yeah, no, it genuinely is, yeah. But it's strange because Princess Peach is the window into that. She's the one yeah. who like does all the exposition and everything. But she is also an alien to this world. She's not of that place, yeah. Yeah. Like, why, that's why she likes Mario, because yeah. she's a human. And so, but, they, but they've paired them up with a toad who is of this world <laughs> and who presumably is responsible for yeah. constructing it. And knows its ways and yeah. everything. Because you see that brief little montage where yeah, I'm Peach sorry. is training. I know it's a joke, but it's just impractical, isn't it? The pipes when he's going in and he's coming out that end. Oh, yeah, yeah. In. Who designed that? <laughs> exactly, that? yeah. Jesus. And the Toad has, like, no place it, like in the in the plot. He doesn't explain no. anything. He doesn't know no. anything. He just has a frying pan. Yes. That's his contribution to the film. Yeah. Well, bacon. There's all, bacon's always good if you want bacon. Yeah, yeah. If they have bacon in... Well, they don't. He, he fries up some tomatoes for them, doesn't he? Not even mushrooms? No. 
Right, oh no, okay. there might be some okay. vegetables in there, yeah. Okay. There are no pigs in the Mushroom Kingdom. No. Okay. There are penguins, though. There are penguins in the Mushroom Kingdom. Yeah. That's great. That That's great. They do re- they do the rely on that a couple of times. The joke of like yeah, cute little creature with very like deep gravelly boomy voice. Cute creature with uh, yeah like imperial voice and cute fatalistic star. Yeah, which I really hate that thing of I'm cute but death is coming. Yeah. I I really hate that gimmick. Well, it's it- also it could easily fit through the bars. It does fit through the bars and it can fly and it can fly. <laughs> it's a fucking star. Why is it there? Yeah. But yeah, no, because like the I guess the payoff to that is at the end when it kind of introduces the credits. Yeah, where it's like the film's over, everything's over. Oh, the void. Yeah, you're the, in the, vo- the void. The void has come for us. Kind of what it makes you play saxophone, huh? And like I guess that's the last big laugh of the film. How kooky! But it's not. What's the joke? Random. So random. Is it? That's the joke. Okay. Oh, oh how random. Right. And it's kind of See, like, this is what I mean by comedy is an dead. objective thing. Comedy's dead, but yeah. comedy is objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is bad comedy. Because it does, well, I don't know what it is. Absurdity can be funny, just yeah. like someone doing a funny voice or whatever, you know. Yeah. Or just a thing not making sense. But no, that's meant to be... It's the YouTube TikTok humor, which is yeah. oh so random. And... Um, We're all gonna die. Like that kind of... <laughs> exactly. But it wasn't that. No, it wasn't It that. wasn't like utter nihilism quickly juxtaposed with cheerful no, saxophone. Yeah. They, like, no, it's had pure, to do this clunky transition into it. It's pure it. random, yeah. yeah. And it, it's uh, it's kind of a way of... Um, because it's meant to be so frothy and so universal, you know, literally you appeal. Yeah. We don't want any nasty things. So the star that seems miserable, we kind of have to tell the kids at the end, oh, not really. Yeah. He's not really miserable. Mm. It's like when they end... Uh, you know, like a Disney film with all, all the characters singing. Yeah. Like, oh no, Gaston... No, no not in that film, because that's actually a good one. Mm. But, you know, Gaston didn't really die. Yeah. They're all back now for the big sing-along at the end, like Shrek, you know, something yeah, yeah. like that. And I get it. It's like, we don't want the kids to be too, like... Yeah. But also, kids can deal with darkness, as we've said loads yeah. of times. I, I miss, like... You don't get things like the Toy Story 3 monkey anymore. No. Or the Sean the Sheep, the dog in the jail. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Grim. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. You, it's it's an objectively scary yeah, image. Yeah, terrifying. Yeah, and it's just there to be scary because it's funny that the scary thing exists in They try and do film. that in this with the things that chase Luigi. Oh, the um, dry bones. Yeah, but I don't think it's scary. Like, I, no. I, I think I still have a bit of a finger on what would be scary to kids. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think they are. I don't know if it's necessarily supposed to be like... It is like yeah, it's presented yeah. as as, a, as like a quote unquote horror sequence, mm-hmm. but I don't know if it's meant to be scary. I think it's just another reference because Luigi yeah. Luigi stars in his own like sub series of games called Luigi's Mansion, right? Which are horror games, uh, okay. not not like not real yeah, yeah, horror yeah, yeah, games, yeah. like you know family friendly haunted horror mansion, game. Kind haunted of, mansion, yeah. where you have to go around and sort of collect all the ghosts with like a little Ghostbusters yes, like yeah, suck yeah. up the ghost devices, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's just a reference to that. It's Luigi. And when um, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which is like a fighting game, mm. whenever it's announced, like, oh, look at all these characters that were added mm. into the... Uh, one of the characters they added... Well, two of the characters they added in were from the Castlevania franchise. Right. Which is all like Dracula and castles. Yes, yes, and, yes. And the trailer that they did for it, it was Luigi walking around Dracula's castle. Okay. So I think that's just a thing that Nintendo does. It puts Luigi in like creepy environments. Okay, okay. So it's not supposed to be a scary sequence. It's just... Another Mario reference. Right, okay. Bowser being cunt-struck is a good angle. <laughs> Do you know what? Bowser was all right. Bowser was I like okay. Bowser. He was yeah. probably... No, he was probably the best thing in the film, yeah. to be fair, in terms of consistency. Yeah. The piano performance was funny. Yes. That's actually funny. Yeah, like, it's stupid as fuck. But stupid, like, but funny. It's the, 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 like, the, the passion he's putting into it, isn't it? Oh, it's that Jack, like... Yeah. You know. Preach, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, screaming at yeah, the piano. Yeah, yeah. The thing that was weird, it's the kind of... Again, because it's all sugary and gooey and smushy, it's the kind of film that would taught the villain a lesson rather than, like... Yeah, and it felt... There were a couple of moments where it felt like that was happening. Yeah, it but just it didn't. didn't. He, end, he just ends up being a villainy villain at villains. And yeah. I thought, oh, no, there was something like... Had he just, like, learnt, oh, you can't, like... Love is, like, you can't be possessive. You know, something yeah. like that. 
But no, he just kind of ends up being a, a git. Yeah. That they've got to miniaturize and put in a cage. Yeah, because like at the end, like when he's fighting Mario in Brooklyn and Mario's losing, and yeah. he's like, you'll know what it is to be miserable like me. Right. And I think you went yeah. like, oh, that's the message. Yeah. Bowser's miserable. And, and he the, makes everyone else miserable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're going to make him happy and yeah. he's going to apologize. Yes. He just didn't. Yeah, he just didn't. Yeah. That's such a set of blind. They're going to make you miserable like me. Yeah. I was like, hey, I fucking know what it's like to be depressed. Yeah, my fucking know? father doesn't love me. Yeah, my yeah, exactly. It turned out that Bowser's got, like, yeah. daddy issues and all that, that kind of thing. I will say that I did like that. That might be my favourite, like, line in the film. Not for the line itself, yeah. but just for, like, the delivery of it. When, like, Donkey Kong and Mario are in the, the sea monster. Mm. And uh, Donkey Kong is like, you don't know what it's like to not have your father's approval. And Mario's like, well, my father doesn't approve of me either. Mm. And Donkey Kong's like... Like he has, like he, there's that look on his face. He's like, yo, he recognizes Mario yeah, in the yeah, same yeah. position, and he's like, yeah, well, your dad's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like because like, yeah, yeah. it's unexpected. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. Just like, oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That's fine. Like it has moments. It it's has like little, little, moments. little one-off moments. But by the Mario Kart section, I'd kind of mentally checked. Oh god, yeah, I was gone by way that too point. much. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got to say. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, really. No. Uh, other than, like, really young kids for whom the colours will be enough. And I think that's worth noting as well. Because I saw a load of stuff when the film was coming out where, like, loads of websites were like, this is a film for kids. Oh, it is. It's, it really is. Yeah. Aimed like, really like, young kids. Like, like almost like uh, public service announcements. Like, yeah, posting yeah. on their Twitter feeds, like, just so you know, this is a film for kids. It's between, like, My Little Pony and Lego Movie. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not as, like, kiddie kitty as, like pure colour they try and do a little bit more than that yeah but it's not as sophisticated a kids movie as the Lego movie no and it's not trying to be I think it is aiming at a young audience yeah parents family members who don't give a shit about Mario will get nothing out of this it's really the only thing for them are like they're trying with using take on me and Thunderstruck that's going to get the parents they'll like that yeah yeah It's, it's not for most people but kids will like it because kids like everything yes and one like final point, mm-hmm. just because I don't think I was able to fit it in anywhere else. Um, I don't think the animation in this film is particularly outstanding. No, it's not as good as the trailer suggested it would be. But I think the lighting in this film is really, really good. Well, you said it's probably the best animation that they've done, right? It's 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 a- Illumination Animation's best looking film, mm-hmm. and I think the lighting does a lot to help it. Yeah. Because I think it's probably on par with a lot of the stuff they've done in the past, just in terms of, like, the quality of the animation. Yeah, yeah. But, like, all of the stuff in Bowser's little, like, rock ship. Yes. And just, like, the, you know, the scenes when it's set at night and, like, the stuff on Rainbow Road. All that stuff looks really, really good. No, I honestly, I can't complain about the animation at all. The animation, they put effort into it, which is what a shame they didn't put effort into anything else. Yeah. It's a good-looking film. Actually, the only animation quirk that I have a problem with is when the kids and their eyes are dots. That wasn't right to me. Well, that's silly. Okay, that's silly as well, though, because that's, again, another reference, because yeah, that yeah. is replicating a character model yeah, from yeah, a yeah. specific Mario game. Yes. But then when Peach, when they show baby Peach, yes. she doesn't have the dot eyes. Yes. She has normal eyes. Yeah. Because that's not referencing anything. I forget, so just do a I forget normal the fact Peach. that eyes are basically the same your entire life. Yeah. They they, they, they could, are, right? Are they the only no, thing? No, I think, I think they literally are always the same size. Yeah. I think so, in a way. That, that feels right. Yeah, I think it's your eyeballs. But if you do, you would just do smaller versions. The eyes wouldn't evolve from black dots into eyes. Yeah, exactly. That's like fucking millions of years of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you don't grow. What's the white part of your eye called? Iris? Is it pupil? No, the pupil's the black bit. I Ret- think the iris is the coloured ring. Retina? Oh, no, maybe that's the... I don't know. But yeah, you don't grow... Iris is, yeah, iris you is You don't the grow eye whites. No, you don't. What, what's a retina? Retina might be like the uh, part of the the lens, the bit the co- the layer that covers the eye. I don't know. I'm not familiar with eyes. It's not albumin. That's egg. That's egg white. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Okay. <laughs> Got a few notes for this. Okay. <laughs> um. Why? Why? Yeah. Okay. Why, Sam? Well, let's just get through it. Why? <laughs> No, genuinely, why? Like, why did we do this? Oh, why did we do it? Yeah. Oh, because we suspected it would be dreadful and good podcast fodder. Okay. And we weren't wrong. It is it is certainly... <laughs> it's certainly dreadful. Yeah. Okay, so even on a restricted budget, which this has, mm. there are so many basic things that could have been done to make this better. 
Yes, we'll say at the door, this is the worst film of the year so far. It's diabolical. I, I can't imagine it's going to be beaten. No. We've got a shit year ahead of us if this is not the worst film of the year. Mario was not good, I would say, because like, I don't tend to watch films that aren't mm. good, you know. Without remembering maybe some terrible films that we've reviewed on the podcast, Mario's probably the second worst film of the year. Oh, right, okay. Because I don't watch bad movies. Yeah. But there were good things in Mario. I don't think there's anything good. Oh, no, I think Adman's worse than Mario. Oh, yeah, so that's, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, Ant-Man, um, you haven't seen Shazam 2, but I would put Ant-Man and Shazam 2 in pretty much the same... I, I, would, like, say, I would agree that Ant-Man's worse than Mario. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. This has no redeeming qualities. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh has no Absolutely not. redeeming no, qualities. Yeah. Uh, so many basic things could have been done. When you have no money, you need to pour everything into the writing and the ideas. Yeah. Uh, when the, going back to what you say about bottle episodes. Exactly, yeah. It forces you to be creative. Yeah. Winnie the Pooh slasher. Got it. Right. Here's a million. Like, you know. Yeah. I get it. Uh, go nuts. Right. What springs to mind without any real thought, as it did for us when we were watching it? So a pot of honey filled with blood. Now, they flirted with that. Yeah. But not really. Mm. Well, Pooh, like, he eats honey. Yeah. And it kind of just, like, dribbles, dribbles. from his mouth. Yeah. And that's really all they do with... That's kind of it. Yeah. It, he doesn't, like, base his victims in honey and then, like, eat yeah. them or anything like that. No, yeah, it's just... It's, he yeah. just, like, eats honey not very well. <laughs> that's all they really do yeah. with the honey. So, actually, so do you want to quickly do the plot? Like, oh, that's sad they do at the beginning. Right, well... Uh, okay. We need the poo, blood, and honey is... Shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a very good, uh, like... If title, it's a very good title. Yeah, that's, yeah. It. that's all they got yeah. going for them. And if you were, ever, if anyone were ever in favor of copyright laws on a property never expiring, this is what you would use to like yes. back your back up your case. Yeah, this should uh, this film should be studied in like yeah adaptation. Like this is what can be done when when copyrights expire. This is on one side, and then blah blah is on the other side. Yeah, I don't know what this conversation is going to end up being regarding this film. Because right. already there's so much I want to say, and okay. I know I can't say it all at once. Yes. Um, so I don't know yet what, what this review is going to end up being. But uh, we'll do, I'll do the plot quickly, and then yeah. hopefully we'll get to the things. But yeah, so it's like, the, the setup is... Christopher Robin goes into the Hundred Acre Woods one day, and he finds this group of, as the film describes it abomination crossbreeds yeah hybrids yeah yeah they're sort of half animal half human that's the idea is yes. yeah the idea he meets owl he meets rabbit he meets eeyore he meets piglet he meets winnie the pooh we later yeah. discovered that tigger was in a later book he was in the second book so the copyright hasn't expired yeah tigger. so it's like okay everyone but tigger everyone yeah. but tigger no kangaroo but at the same time like no, there is a kangaroo in there not in this film oh right okay but just in like in terms of a core cast, fine. It's just yeah, that's Tigger's fine. the only yeah yeah he's the only absence. one where you would be like yeah where is he yeah yeah but yeah the others are present and he despite the warning signs again the film's words not mm. mine he befriends them he sort of feeds them he spends time with them he lives his childhood with them mm. and then the day comes where he has to decide whether he's going to go to college or not and he decides to go so he essentially leaves them behind as he moves away. And they are hit... Well, the Hundred Acre Woods is hit with a particularly harsh winter mm-hmm. where these uh, Winnie the Pooh creatures are forced into a cave that they can't leave. And during that period of time, they're trapped in there and they start to starve. And they resort to... Because there are no other options, mm. they eat eel. Mm-hmm. And this basically... They go insane. Mm-hmm. And they go like, right, we're never doing that again. Yeah. As a result, we are going to turn our backs on humanity. Christopher Robin, this guy who like brought us in, mm. and he's now abandoned us, and so we're going to abandon all our yeah, humanity. We're going to become feral, and we're going to become feral, and we're going to kill anyone who crosses us. Right. And we're never going to have to well, put up with that again. That's where, like, you filled in that blank because that last bit is a stretch. It says that they they went insane yeah. and rejected humanity. Yeah. But then we, you connecting the dots between rights. Does that mean they eat humans? Does that mean they just kill them? They hate them like ideologically. Do you know? What I mean? It's like, it's a yeah. Weird okay. Confusion. So this is yeah. one of the many problems yes. in the film, I suppose. Yeah, is that 
it's never really clear what's what's going on. What's with going them. on? Yeah, yeah, whether they have like they've gone berserk, and so they're just killing people out of like crazed delirium. Because arguably, they would have to have rejected their humanity to commit an act as feral as eating Eeyore. Right. And yet their response to that is to become feral. Because yeah. they never want to eat Eeyore again. Or, like, uh, themselves again. Yeah. It's like, do they do they develop a taste for it? Like, it's horrible. It should have been like they had to do it. And yeah. then, yeah, they all mentally snapped. Yeah. And now they hate Christopher Robin for having left them. Yeah. And by extension, they hate people. So they kill people. Yeah. Done. Like, it doesn't have to be complicated. Psychologically complicated. No. Uh, it, it just, the film never really connected those two things. No. But, like, as messy as it is, yeah. as a starting point, fine. It's fine. Then, yeah, okay, that's now, a good place to start. Now we do Dark Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. You know. Right, so after the sp- a spate of murders, and yeah. the, a publicised murders, it's not like this is happening in secret. Oh, yeah, this is happening under the opening credits. Yes. Reports of murders in the Hundred Acre Woods. Yes. So after that spate of murders, Christopher Robin is drawn back to investigate what happened to his friends. Mm. He's your main character. Yeah. Not a random group of hot girls. As, uh, as it ends up as being. As it ends up being. Yeah. They have zero connection to the source material. Mm. I get that it's a slasher trope. Yeah. But this is a slasher and Winnie the Pooh. Yes. You can find a way of having your honey and, honey and eating it. <laughs> well, here belies the... For me, I think the problem of the film. There are many problems with the film, but the major problem Mm -hmm. that all of the other problems scuttle around Mm -hmm. is that this is not a Winnie the Pooh film. No, it betrays the... It betrays, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Belies, Uh, betrays, I don't know. Yeah, no. Uh, Words. I know what it's called. I don't know what they are. Belai, yeah, it feels like it should mean. It's the thing that undergirds everything. Like, beneath it lies this. Belai means lie about. Oh, right. So this gives a false impression of. Okay. This belies the Oh, no, it very much gives... Yeah, the impression is very much that this is not a Winnie the Pooh film. Yes, but so it would be. I was wrong. Okay, no, it's no, no, fine. no, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like the fact it's called Winnie the Pooh belies the fact that it's not a Winnie the Pooh. Film. Yes, <laughs> like, there you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so the opening animation is probably the best thing really in the film mm. in terms of you don't really bat an eyelid. It's like fine. Yeah, but it's a sign of things to come in terms of the writing. Okay, even like basic things. Like, with grammar. Yeah. So, well, firstly, it was, with the years came maturity. And it's sort of, that's just a bit of shit writing. Okay. Um, Do do the maturity not come with years? But but yes, implicitly. Oh, I see. Yeah, like, like, why why, why would you say that? Yeah, okay. It's like, with the years, they grew older. Right. Well, yeah, you know, it's meant to be like a storybook, right? Yeah. Um... Is there not a better way of expressing that idea? But that, that was like a little tiny thing. And substance and style aside, it yeah, it gets basic language wrong. Like, they developed a hatred to all things human. Mm. What's for, isn't it? It's like someone's second language. I, I know this is me being like a grammar Nazi, yeah. but they're like very simple things that you should get right. I think it's fair because with my limited exposure to Winnie the Pooh as an adult, obviously yeah. I was very familiar with the, with the shows and the films when I was younger. Mm-hmm. I don't think I really read the books, but you know, I consumed a lot of content. Mm-hmm. Having like briefly revisited certain adaptations now that I'm older, yeah. there is a very like no. u- uniquely poetic way to the yes. how those stories are told. I agree. That and it I d- has its own language, yeah, but that I, does not fall into that category. No, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. I don't know if the intention was to replicate that. No, that they that's just like, a, it's just a bad writer. Okay. God, no, I don't they even bothered. I doubt they even read Winnie the Pooh. No, right? based on the yeah, rest yeah. of the film, I, I, I'm comfortable in saying that yeah, yeah, no yeah. effort was made to replicate No, like, it the has way that poetic... It's not as out there as Clockwork Orange, where it has some, it, its own idiom and its own language. Yeah. But it's like, um, how are you feeling, Eel? Not very how. Yeah. It's like, okay, I kind of get what that means. No, something like, yeah, they developed a hatred to all things. That's the failure of, okay, like, understanding the language. So he returns after five years. Yeah. Which I would say doesn't feel like enough of a passage of time to be dealing with, like, oh, I had these nostalgic experiences and I'm now revisiting my childhood. Five years just isn't long enough. I don't know. Like, in the modern world... You know, in terms of like how quickly things are, I'm looking. I'm looking at it through the prism of media, uh, understandably. Yeah. But like in terms of how quickly things are remade, and how like 
just like you know the, the certain phases of your life like mm-hmm. the way you know i like you look back on that i was like oh god that was years ago and it was only like a couple of years ago yeah of course i, I feel like yeah of course and like, it's not a massive stretch no it's this is this is a kind of a nitpick i i personally just didn't feel i mean like what were we doing five years ago and you go oh yeah yeah well that's the, it's not that distant from not even this podcast you know yes but if you actually think of what you were doing five years ago it's not a world away from yeah. what you're doing now, I, I don't know. If you, I just think if you're dealing with childhood and how things have changed and nostalgia, I mean, it is 27 years. I know that's a whole different thing. Yeah, but that that's closer than five. I think five is just like not enough time. Okay, five years is more of a my wife was killed and now I'm an alcoholic passage <laughs> of time. Right. Uh, so he takes his fiance. Yeah, and she says to him, "Imagination is what made you so successful." But he's a doctor. But I didn't quite... Yeah, imagination, like... I guess you would need a bit of a ma- imagination. Sometimes you've got to think outside the box. With, yeah, to like come but, up with strange diagnoses, but yeah. fact is what you need as a doctor. And knowledge he, of things that Knowledge exists. of things. Anatomy. And he can't even be a doctor, because five years is not enough time to oh, become yeah, of course. a doctor. Yeah, it's like, yeah, all right. Yeah. And, okay, so in that respect, you're completely <laughs> right about the time skip not being enough. Oh, that's just like literally factual. not enough yeah, time yeah. to become a doctor. To become yeah. a doctor, at least eight years to become a doctor. You yeah. still be a med student, right? Okay, so budget, yes, we've always got to remember that, take yeah. that into account. But they still did build sets, yeah. And if you're gonna do that, don't film it all grey and bleak, like I'm walking into a fucking slasher film. <laughs> do the opposite. Do the "Don't hug me, I'm scared" thing, where it's yeah, it's all sweet and colourful, unlike a children's television show. Yeah. And then you infuse that with menace and horror. Mm. It should have been they stumble across the old Winnie the Pooh house or whatever. Yeah. It's all yellow and tally tabby ish. And then he opens a pot and it's fucking like a liver in it. Like, yeah. Ah! You know, like what's the that animation style where you zoom in and it's like really detailed all of a sudden? Oh god, what's the what's it called? Is Japanese this, word. Yeah, right? is it Sakuga? I can't remember. Or something like, like that. But you know what I mean, where it's all like so bland and it's it's all smooth surfaces and there's a very like specific Yeah, well Spongebob does it a lot. Spongebob, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where yeah. yeah, well, they have those like de- like gross out because it's so much detail, it's grotesque. Yeah, that yeah. that's what that's what they should have done. Yeah, make it look like it's out of a children's book. Uh yeah, don't hug me, I'm scared would have been a really, really good like yeah. uh point of comparison stylistically. Yeah. I don't know what the budget is for Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you're not uh, already like in that world, like if you're not a puppeteer or if you're mm-hmm. not, if you don't already have a direct line to craftsman. Well, it, I'm, it would be difficult to do, but well, yeah, on, on filming you- it like this, like fucking shitty, yeah. bleak, dark slasher film does it no favours. Well, on, on YouTube, obviously, they're, they're concentrated budgets because they made one, then pro- they waited like, well, like a year or two yeah. years till they got the budget together. The series on Channel 4. I would imagine the budget is higher. Yeah. But still, like, they did build sets. They just built horrible ones. Yeah. In Blood and Honey now. In Blood and Honey, yeah, yeah. And it's just more effective if it's a lovely little cottage that's got a pot of blood. Because the idea of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey is, hey, guys, remember Winnie the Pooh? Remember childhood? Remember that wholesome thing from your childhood? I'm going to fuck it. I'm going to rape your childhood. Yeah, I'm going to fuck it and you're going to watch me. Yeah. And it just doesn't. No, it doesn't. It really does. Like, that's what this film should have been. It should have... I said to you while I was yeah. watching it, this should have ruined Winnie the Pooh. It should have ruined Winnie the Pooh, yeah. And instead I was watching it thinking, I'm not watching Winnie the Pooh right it's now. It's not Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. It's not. I'm like, we have a friend who's like really into Winnie the Pooh. Mm. And I said to her, she was like, I'm not watching it. Yeah. I have no interest in watching it. I said, you actually could, because it doesn't do anything to the... No. Anything you remember. It's just... Because... It's so divorced from it. I feel like... People, just like normal people, not not necessarily people who would defend this, and people maybe close to production, and certainly just like normal mm. cinema goers, would probably think like like hear what we're saying now and think, oh, you're just overthinking it. No, it's a Winnie. No, no, this yeah, is, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Winnie the Pooh slasher film. It doesn't need to be this like well constructed thing. It doesn't need to be like this bastardization of Winnie the Pooh tropes. It doesn't need to be like. It just needs to be like this goofy slasher film. Mm-hmm. No. No. That's the key thing. That's the thing that this film forgets. And that... Because as an audience member, you don't realise that that's the key. Mm-hmm. This has to be a bastardization of Winnie the Pooh for it to work as a Winnie the Pooh slasher. It needs yeah. to take the 
the fanciful dialogue and make it, like, you know, recontextualize it into something fucked up. It needs to take that gorgeous fairy tale scenery and corrupt it. It needs to take those characters and make them, like, broken and disgusting. Yeah, and look, I don't want to... I don't want to pat us to pat ourselves on the back, but the fact matters. You know, we're, we're big into film and TV. We, you know, we've written. We, you know, you edit, and it's something that we want to work in. Mm. But it's not like we watched this, then went away to the drawing board and went, right? How could this have been better? We and were really riffing. thought it through. We were riffing. Yeah, we did the opposite of overthinking. Well, we didn't underthink it. It's literally it's the definition of an occurrence. Everything just occurred to us. Yeah, it's all right. Winnie the Pooh. What do you do? And then it just unfolded. Yeah. This wasn't like us going away really thinking about what he should have done. Yeah. And no, I feel like this doesn't have to be uber sophisticated and the next, you know, cabin in the woods or whatever. It does need to be overthought. It just needs to be thought. Yeah. It needs to be thought about. It's so, it's so simple. You take the language and you bastardize the language. Yeah. You take the dynamics and you fucking make it horrifying. Yeah. You know, but you keep the dynamics intact. Yeah. Piglet in this is just a guy in a generic boar mask. Yeah. Nothing about the way he conducts himself says it's like, it screams Piglet. No, because, right, when you go, right, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, right? Yeah. So, right, I get it. It's slash of Winnie the Pooh. The first thing you do is you draw a Venn diagram, mm. slash of Winnie the Pooh, right? Is there anything already that overlaps that yeah. I can use? Right, no, okay. So now how do I put the horror tropes in Winnie the Pooh? The very first thing you do is that. It's Winnie the Pooh, but horror. What do I get out yeah. of that? How do I milk that? Are there any famous set pieces from that first book that I can recontextualize as a horror sequence? Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. To me, the most iconic emblem of what this film should have been is a pot full of blood. Yeah. Right, Winnie the Pooh, pot of honey. Right, we make that blood. That's the horror thing. Yeah. That should have been the poster, is a pot dripping with blood. I don't know if this is from the first book, but like, um, there, I think there are several moments throughout the series where yeah. Winnie the Pooh gets stuck in something. In a hole. In a so hole. now it's like a man trap. It's like a booby yeah. trap. Yeah, someone yeah, gets yeah. trapped in a hole. Or Winnie the Pooh is chasing someone down and he gets trapped in a hole and they are right. trying to get away as he is scraping his way out of the hole. Yeah. Like, tearing himself apart just to get at them. And Winnie the Pooh is particularly always famished, so he's like, when he, he eats people, he ravishes them, you know, he fucking yeah. devours no, them. Yeah, genuinely, like, yeah, 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 Winnie the Pooh is always hungry. Right. And, you, and you're always hungry. The, and the, you like, can... the, the silly bear's always hungry, dot, 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 for flash. Yes. That's the... T- yes! <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't come to this podcast with that in mind. No, no, we genuinely. We just ripped on Yeah. It's like, that's, you know... Yeah. It's, yeah, he's yeah. always hungry. Like, that's why he keeps killing. He can't yeah. satiate his hunger. Yeah. And that's even more powerful because the whole reason they've turned they, away from their humanity is because they had to eat one of their own. And you keep the whole, you know, that's right, the silly bear because you keep that childlike thing about it. And you make, I would say you make those characters kind of childlike in that they still behave yeah. as much as they can like they're in a children's book. Yeah. But... Instead of, like, a nice picnic camper, they've got, like, heads and... (laughs) Yeah. It's like, you know... Like, Piglet's whole thing about, oh, Piglet is, like, this anxious little creature. Yeah. That can be reworked. So it's like, Pooh is already this, like, feral, proficient killer. Yeah. And And Piglet wants to prove his worth. Yeah. Yeah. And so Piglet is, like, he's not very good... And Pooh kind of, like, punishes him for that. Maybe yeah. there's... Because there's there's a whole thing about, like, they never speak, right? Yeah. And the film does end with Winnie the Pooh saying one line when it doesn't have anywhere near the amount of power that it's no, supposed that to. it thinks it does, yeah. But that could be, like, a way of, of conveying that. Just, like, within the story. Piglet still talks. Yes. Pooh doesn't. Piglet still talks. And Pooh is yeah. trying to literally beat that out of him. And depending on where you go with the story, the one that talks and is the most anxious is the one that could be reasoned with. Or yeah. is, the, is the bridge between them and the creatures. The one that turns against the family to help them. Yeah. Ultimately, you know? Yeah. And that is him conquering his anxieties. He helps the heroes. Yeah. Like, fuck you. I don't need to please you anymore. Or, I'm doing the right thing. Or the heroes inadvertently do something that to Piglet proves that Pooh was right. They are right. monsters that we need to right. take out of the world. Yes. Yes. Basic things. Yeah. You know, the most obvious things. And I just, I know you said like, oh, people will, and they will say, this film doesn't need to be good. And I always think, why? Yeah. A a B movie that's made for no money, oh, it just needs to recoup it. It, You can also try and make it good. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you? That's so boring and lazy. This would have been such, like, if this was, like, good now, 
And I know that, like, the thing is, this film could be measured. There are metrics by which you could measure this film, which suggests that it is good. Yeah, it made money. It got a cinema release. Yeah. This fucking no budget, mm. out of nowhere, from no one film. Yeah. Was released in cinemas. It's probably the worst film to ever have been released in theatrically. Yeah. That I can think of. Yeah. It's certainly the worst looking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's not, it's never like, they never make too many amateur filmmaking mistakes. The camera's no. always in focus. Yeah. There's never an, an excess of film grain. Sound is fine. Sound is fairly good for yeah. what it is. The score is like as forgettable as yeah. films like this usually are. Yeah. When they do gore, it's like the kind of stuff that you do expect from something like this. Even though it's CG. Even like, though it's CG. Yeah, yeah it is CG. Yeah. But that's another thing. Like, they... but, that, but that's just the peeve of mine with, with slashes in general. It's like the whole point of this is it's supposed to be visceral. Oh, I think, yeah. And CGI is not visceral. I would promote that peeve to a, a, a genuine, substantial criticism yeah. because these fe- slashes need to feel chonky and meaty and uh, yeah. and sludgy and I shouldn't see that it was done on a computer. Yeah, that CGI blood it. plugins do not have that no. dimension to them. No, they're not. They're intangible. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. I want to see buckets of blood being thrown. I want to see Grand Guignol when I get a slasher, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, I said like it's been released in cinemas, and also it's more than made its money back. Oh, it's a ma- it's one of the, probably most one of the most commercially successful films of the year. It's going to end up being a hundred thousand dollar budget. It's yeah. made four point two million back. It's yeah. already got a sequel in the works. There's a cinematic universe they're going to start making out of this thing. Yeah, because the director has said I'm going to do a Peter Pan. I'm going to do a Bambi. Yeah, and they're all going to be slashes. Yeah, I really hope if he does, he like tries. Well, the next one, it's, you know? It's a grift. It's like um, that Red Letter Media video about Adam Sandler. This yeah. is how he makes money. Yeah. He gets paid all the, these deals from ad- companies they get advertised in the film, pays off his friends, yeah. and they don't bother trying to do a good script or good performances. Yeah. The film makes money because these films always do, mm. and they get a massive payout for it. It'd be exactly the same. I don't have to make them good. The, very, the concept alone will get bums and seats because horror genre fans will go and watch anything horror yeah. people that like horror will go and watch anything that's horror yeah. even if they don't end up liking it it's just a con it's a long con yeah but how amazing would it have been if this was good genuinely good yeah like I mean it, I think it never could have written past a cer- risen past a certain level no it was never going to, it was never going to be Parasite it was never going not to Parasite. be Parasite but like Cabin in the Woods is like the best you can aim for yeah it, would, it wouldn't have been as good as that but it could have been a lot of fun it could have been like a like a Shaun of the Dead or like a Scott Pilgrim where it's 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 not like primetime premiere material, but it's, it's something that you can... It's not prestige drama. It's not, yeah. Presti- yeah. it's not prestige drama, but it's something that you could, without shame, put at the top of like your favourites Right, yes. Even though it's like... Yeah, I know it's not it's like it could, drama. It could, it like Mad Max, the distinction between Mad Max and Spotlight, which is there's substance and then there's like craft at its finest and style at its finest. Yes. But I know there's not a lot of meat to it, yeah. as it were. You know? Yeah, like this could have been something, like rather than being something that you could genuinely point to and go, this is why we shouldn't let copyrights expire. Yes. You could point it and go, this is why we should. So let's let copyright. This is why we should, we should uh, protect them. I'm actually all for we should Sorry, we shouldn't protect them. We should allow copyrights yeah. to expire. We should allow people to do fucked up shit like this. I'm down with copyright. I think people need to own what they create, but I'm also down when it expires, then we should be able to do whatever we want with it. Like, mm. it's now all of ours. Yeah. You know. We could have done something with <laughs> the poop, blood, and honey. Yeah, we could have done it better. Could have done it better. Yeah, that's one of those things. I, you know, my occasional public persona notwithstanding, I don't actually think I'm God's gift to writing. I really, really don't. I'm self-loathing about everything I ever do. Right. <laughs> but this is one film I can look at and genuinely go, no, I could have done better. Yeah. I 100% could have done better. And within the parameters that they had. Because like, yeah. you, you could sit here and go, oh, well, they, they should have done this, 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 and this. And a legitimate response to any of those points could be, yeah, but they only had 100,000. Like, they had no money to make yeah. this. Yeah. But, like, even with the little money they had, there was a better way of doing a lot of what they did. For example, like, the aesthetic of the characters. Yeah. We talked already about Piglet. It's just a generic, like, boar mask. Mm-hmm. Winnie the Pooh. It's, like, kind of looks like Winnie the Pooh, the mask that he's wearing. A, a, a bit. Yes. A bit. Like, yes. it's deliberately fucked up. But it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, I, I, if I squint, that kind of looks like Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. 
But it's literally just a guy in a, in a bear mask. Where the mouth moves a bit. Where the mouth moves yeah. a bit. It's just a guy in like lumberjack type clothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wearing a vaguely Winnie the Pooh looking mask. And that's a problem considering they're meant to be these hybrid freakish things. Yeah. Because it's not. You you know that's not their face. No. And the way they're drawn in the beginning suggests something a lot more A lot strange. closer to their animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the, they can maybe speak. Like that's... Yeah. That's kind of it, but... But if you're working in the realm of like, right, well, we have this human actor and we can't really do much to him. There's still more you could have done. Like... T- but that's why they hi- that's why they he did the whole all their hybrids is because he knew he'd have to get yeah, away with excuse. it being a man in a yeah, mask. But that's fine. Yeah. You keep that. Yeah. And instead of putting him in this like weird lumberjack uniform, have him like yeah. in the Winnie the Pooh mask. Have him wearing like a red top, and then just nothing. Nothing. But with the genitalia having been eaten. Yeah, like, so smooth, like smooth it smooth. out. Well, like all scarred up and yeah. Do, up. do a bit. Yeah, of, yeah. You do a bit of prosthetic, so it's not like there's no like nudity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like it because now it looks like Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, because he's wearing the red top and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. With he's wearing less clothing and he looks more like the character. Yeah, exactly. You would have spent less money overall, probably. Well, maybe not yeah. with the prosthetic, with- but like you know, you would have with very little on top of what you've already done. Yes, you've all, you've made a better version of the character no, that you with had. what they did, with the things they did do with the money they had. Within that exists the possibility of of a better good film. Yeah, because they built sets. Like, okay, we've got money to build sets. Yeah, right. That's enough for me. If you can build good sets, I can get you a good thing out of this. Yeah, you know. Is it meant to be taken seriously? This is another fundamental. <sighs> yeah, question. I mean, who knows? Because it's not honestly. funny. No, it's not going for funny. It's not trying to be like a. It's not, no, it's not Cabin in the Woods. It doesn't have no or Shaun of the Dead. It's nothing, not. It's not done with a with a wry smile. It's not a slasher parody where they're using Winnie the Pooh. It's not a comedy. It doesn't think that it's a comedy. I think that's fair. Yeah, but I I think it does want to make you laugh on the level of its goal, like oh Winnie the Pooh slasher. Yeah, like that it's silly, but it doesn't do that. No, it's it's galling, but. Not because of what it's doing yeah. to the Winnie the Pooh property. So what you're left with is having to take it at face value as a slasher. And it's rubbish. Yeah. It's a rubbish slasher. So it goes without saying that the acting is atrocious. Yes. The girls can't even move properly. No, it's that, like, amateur... I'm talking, like, the lowest level of acting now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you can't move and say lines at the same, the same time. Same type. Yeah, you have to always be thinking about exactly yeah. what you're doing. You deliver your line, you do your, like, designated movement for the scene, you say the next line. You yeah. can't put the two together. Yeah. There's nothing natural about it. Yeah. They're always thinking about what they're doing. It's stilted. It's awkward. The masks are terrible. The design is terrible. The whole conception of the poo creatures is abysmal. Yeah. Piglet is just a feral pig. What happened to Owl and Rabbit? Well, that's the question I've got. The archetypes of the original characters should have been preserved in some way. Like we said, a fucked up Texas Chainsaw family dynamic. Yeah, yeah where'd they go? Where'd Owl and Rabbit yeah. go? Because that's... Are they saving those for the sequel? Well, that's that's fun, isn't it? There's, there's, there's fun you could have with that. Like, yeah, Pooh is like always hungry, so he's killing all the time. Mm-hmm. Piglet is anxious and trying to prove his worth. Rabbit is OCD. Yeah. So he's like... He has this idea of like how he wants to kill them, but he can never get it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's always fuck Like, he's killing people, but he's, like, frustrated, so he's, like, fucking them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even more so. Or it depends what you do. If you, if you like, go m- trying to make it broadly funny, yeah. it's that. It's that he can't figure out, oh, damn it, I fucking cut the leg, wrong leg off. Yeah. Or you make it really fucking sinister, where, like, you're, you're, te- you're treating it really seriously. Mm. And again, the goal of what you're doing, like, where he's killing someone... But then it's just like in the room, hovering over the corpse, switching the light bulb on and off. Yeah. Because he's OCD and it's just like this fucking haunting image. I'm staring at the corpse yeah. and the camera trails away as he's just like, you know he's going to be there for hours looking yeah. at the body. Yeah. Like, where it's horrific, but it's also Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, like, yeah. And then Owl, because yeah. he's like intelligent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just fucking with them psychologically. Yeah, he's torturing them yeah. psychologically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot you can do. So much, yeah. So much to so do. So much fun. So that just was not had. No. Well, it's never clear exactly what they're doing. Um, so this is what the director said, Reese Freak Waterfield, or Freak, uh, okay. uh, the auteur behind this. Um, <laughs> because they've had to fend for themselves so much, they've essentially become feral. So they've gone back to their animal roots. They're no longer tame. They're like a vicious bear and pig who want to go around and try and find prey. 
fine, but they don't eat them. No, they just kill them. So it's like an intellectual. Well, they thing. don't even just kill them because Christopher Robin is kept. He keeps Christopher them alive. Five years. Yeah, yeah. It do- none of it scans. No, and I resent it for making me think about this at all. Yeah, but how did they fare before Christopher Robin came along? If mm. they've gone back to their animal roots, yeah, implying that's what they were like before meeting him, and he civilized them. How could there exist a friendship in the first place? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. They should have just been talking animals that, like, mm. m- made friends with a human. Yeah. And then they went feral. It shouldn't have been, they were feral, then they got better, but now they've gone back to being feral. Yeah. It's not, like, in a way, he made it too complicated. Yeah. You know? But you know it was just so they could get away with, ah, oh, it's a bloke, but he's got a mask. Mm. You know? Also, don't eat eel. Eat one of the more boring characters. Yeah. For fuck's sake. Okay, just for fun, because yeah. we've done it with all the other characters yeah. now. We've explained what Pooh's unique relationship with killing yeah. is, and Piglet and Rabbit and Owl. How does Eeyore kill? How does Eeyore kill? Does he kill? Is it more like Piglet, where he's sort of the closest to human of all of them? Or yeah. is he the most far gone? Or is he somewhere in the middle? Okay, well, Eeyore's depressed. That's his thing, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, either like there's he has a conscience about what they're doing, so yeah. he's sad that they're killing. Yeah. Oh yeah, like filtering the depression through a way that he kills them. That's tricky. Because maybe um, when you start thinking of it in those terms, I'm not suggesting at all that this is what the guy was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like, oh, Eeyore is the most complicated one to figure out, therefore he's the one that should die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, help, that helps me in the long run. But nothing springs to mind immediately. Not about him killing other people, unless he's just crying as he does it, which is like hor- horrifying in its own way. Yeah. I would say more that they've got to keep him locked up. no. They have to stop him from eating himself. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because he's suicidal. Yeah. He's depressed and suicidal. They've got to stop him eating himself. He doesn't want to kill other people. Okay. He just cares about killing himself. Okay. So they've got to stop him eating himself. So do they kill, like, do they sort of share their kill with him because it, like, distracts him from eating himself? Yes, because he's just miserable. Okay. So he, maybe he is the one that's, like, remembered his... Uh, you know, that they weren't always feral machines. So and that's like, why he's the best. Yeah, he's always flagellating himself. Like, we are monstrous, we are evil. Yeah. And he's trying to eat himself. And they keep, like, dangling, like, <laughs> human flesh <laughs> under his nose, so he's not doing it. It's somewhere to start, you know, like, yeah. something like that. But yeah, don't kill one of the more, the funner characters. Yeah. Like, kill Kanga or Owl or but something. But then again, if, the, if these characters are going to have no character at all, it literally doesn't matter who you kill. That's true. And... I, Eeyore is a nickname of mine that some people call me. Yeah. And so, in a way, I'm glad that I don't have to watch Eeyore be defamed. Yeah. <laughs> in this franchise. If, in fact, if you want to go fucking dark, eat Kangaroo and Roo. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, the, eat the child. Yeah. Or just... Uh, there wouldn't be enough of Roo. But, like, if you just ate Roo, then it's interesting, because, like, oh, well, what does Kanga do then? Does she go insane with them? Or is she, like, a third party? Yeah, another, like set of um, motivations that like yeah fuck it why not do that I think eating Rue is the most fucked up thing because they're eating the child yeah and maybe they they rationalise that like oh it's the one with the least to get like life experience and so yeah you know what I mean like you don't start with Eeyore no you you, or maybe well it's it's not it's a bit of meat until the winter's over but then they have to keep going. Maybe that's it. Maybe they eat Rue because it's like, well, we're not going to be stuck here for long, but we right. need something. So they eat Kanker as well. And then the Who's winter like, draws longer. Weeping over Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> and that's why Kanga goes insane first, maybe, because she's like, we ate right. him for nothing. Right. Yes. Because now we're just hungry again and we still can't leave. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So there's a completely gratuitous moment where Pooh rips off the top of, of a girl. Oh, yeah. And uh, we get some tits. And that implies that what we're getting is a shameless, gratuitous slasher. Yeah. But that's all there is. Yeah. And it's a weird complaint because I'm not a fan of that, like, pointless nudity thing. But mm. I know it's a trope. So if you're going to do it, you either double down and do it all the way. Yeah. Or don't do it at all. Because the context in which it happens... It's so ludicrous. Yeah. But, like, they have a girl later in, in a, like, bikini in a jacuzzi. Mm. Much easier context yeah. to have your tits out. But he literally just takes her top off and then kills her. And it's not because, like, he wants to fuck her or rape her. And it just... No, yeah. They're struggling and their top comes off. Yeah. And then he just bashes her head in. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, really? Mm. Like, and if you're going to do that, then do it. 
because that's a joke in and of itself the, the contrivance yes. of nudity you yeah know? At one point, I think Piglet writes "Get out" on the window outside the house oh, yeah. in blood. Now that's you know scary, but I think it's it's the the stress in the sentence where they go, "Oh my god, he put it outside the house." <laughs> well, that's better. Yeah, that's yeah better it'd than be worse the if house. it was inside the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. Why would you go for a break in Hundred Acre Wood where there's been a, a, a rash of horrific? Yeah. If, if there hadn't been murders, yeah. then I would understand it because it seems quite picturesque yes. and nice. But it's a famous killing spot at this point. Yeah. And the whole reason that the main character has gone there is because she's being stalked by someone yeah. who broke into her house. Yes. And so she's trying to get away from that. Very much out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. But also, like, does that ever come back? No, because. As we're going to get to, but we might as well get to now. She just dies at the end. Yeah. The, the they film, just kill her. The film <laughs> just, doesn't end. It no, just it does, it stops. stops. It yeah. just stops, yeah. But very quickly, yeah, so either you have the people they do kill in Hendrake Wood, it's surreptitious, so it's more like disappearances in Hendrake Wood, yeah. which is like still a bit like maybe we shouldn't go there, but also, ooh, that's quite, like, interesting. You know, people mm. are into that freaky shit. Yeah. And, like, disappearances, you go, well, I'm not going to... Dis- There's a reason for it. Yeah. You're not going to assume they're being butchered by these feral animals. Yeah, yeah. But if you are going to go with famous killing spot, that's why Christopher Robin goes back. Mm. Either to try and save his friends... Yeah. Or to work out what's happened to them. Yeah. And then you've got that mechanic bloke, the Harbinger character... Oh, yeah. ...that has a Southern American accent. yeah. And then doesn't at the end, and is Cockney. Yes. Suddenly, yeah. what was that about? Well, because this is British. I, 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 we were initially confused. Like, did they film in America? But and they've got Americans to do British accents. Yeah, because the copyright's gone in America, right? Yeah, and the British accents do sound ropey sometimes. Yes. Like with Christopher Robin. Yeah. I don't know what they did, but they did film in Britain. Okay. So, what's with the? Again, it's like, oh, that, that's a trope. No, uh, you, you folks better get, you know. It's literally that. But, yeah. But it's not America, and then he doesn't keep it up. And no one else is doing anything like that. No. No, I think that's just a genuine mistake. Just, just that was it. left in. Yeah. Because that is the trope. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm the, the southerner in the, in the abandoned gas station that tells you not to go any further. Yeah. So at the very end, they're like a, in the climax, the few that are left alive are escaping. And then. Who is stalking them through the forest, and then the truck rocks up with that guy and his four mates, yeah, who all look like the backwards incest killers yes. that you get in any other slasher. Long like, hey, don't you look pretty, you know? Yeah. And there's something funny about them ending up being chivalrous and defending the girls, yeah. but it's not doing that. No, it's not going for that. No, no, no. yeah. It's- so it's like, where are these five blokes going? <laughs> Like, what are they doing? Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just kind of a weird scenario. Then there's that one weird shot where oh, it looks man. like you're sitting in a cinema. Yeah, and where stood up who is you. suddenly, like, nine feet taller than the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was bizarre. Um, and yes, it doesn't end. It just stops. Mm. The big closer is that Pooh speaks. Yeah. You left. But he kills off our main character because she ends up kind of being the main character. Yeah. And then we're back with Christopher Robin. Now, that idea in better hands and with a better idea might work Mm. but you shift protagonist roles and you end up where you started but Christopher Robin needed to be the main character in this film yeah now blessedly with this actor he wasn't yes because I think that the leading girl probably was the best actor in the film yeah but that's not saying much no she's just beige the kills aren't inventive they're not funny no they're not much of anything the blood is CG so any tactile sense of stodge or grunge that you should get you don't Ultimately, it's the worst thing that a film like this can be, which is it's dull. Yeah. That's the worst thing you can say about it. We've talked about it more than it deserved to be talked about. Absolutely. But at the same time... Because it's so flawed, there's so much you can exactly, say about it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's kind of a shame, uh, really, that it, it, it ended up getting as much attention as it did because it really doesn't deserve it. And I wish I could recommend it on the level of it's stupid, it's not Winnie the Pooh, uh, but it's a good, but it's like a fun slasher. Yeah. It's not even that. No. It's boring. Yeah. Uh, the only... Uh, its only function in the world is it deserves to be dissected. 
Just to be like, right. Critically. Yeah. What's, educationally. What the fuck is wrong with this? Yeah. Let's find out. It's a zero star film. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, yes. Because it can be all those things. It can be bad, badly acted. The Room isn't a zero star film. Because no. it's fun to watch. Yeah. This isn't. Right. I, I didn't find it fun to watch. I didn't no, no. like hate the experience, but I, I didn't enjoy it no. on any level. Yeah. Because it's not even like, it's not even so bad that it's funny. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just amateur and annoying yeah. and dull. So we don't recommend it oh, on any level not. to anybody. No. Yeah. And don't even, don't even be like, oh, this sounds terrible. I have to see it. No. No, no. It's, it's, really, be- it's should- better than that, you know, conversely. And that it's not even so bad that you should go and watch it. Yeah. It's better than that. Which is, uh, which is worse. Yeah, which is worse. Which is worse, yeah. yeah. Had it been worse, it would have been better. Yeah. It would have been one star. But no, it's better than that, so it's nothing. But Get it? <laughs> <laughs> That's our lot. Yeah. We're done. <laughs> we need to eat. We got it out yeah. of our system. Yeah. Finally. And so, yeah, let's leave it there. So, we'll see you next time. <laughs> right That's then. it. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.